noite a todos. Fala, Fá. Doutor Luiz, Davi. Fala. Todos. Tudo bom, Carlos? Já. Boa noite, Carlos. Quem é que está aqui embaixo que eu não estou vendo? A doutor... Doutor Kerr. Rodrigo. alguns minutos para as pessoas entrarem e já já a gente inicia as apresentações. O Davi tem organizado um evento que acontece toda semana, eles tomam vinho junto das, das discussões. A dar mal, né? Aqui é meio, meio esquisito começar às quatro horas da tarde tomando vinho, né? Não que, não que eu não goste. Doutor Pimenta, sabadão, a gente vai começar às nove da manhã, porque o convidado vai ser o Luke Kim, da Coreia. Vai começar, mano, mas é sábado, né? Sábado pode. Sábado pode. Só aqui, ó. Nove da manhã eu vou autorizar. Eu estou do lado da, da minha geladeira de vinho, para mim é muito fácil. We just we just mocking about everybody having a glass of wine and David is organizing a meeting uh, every Monday or so that you know is a spine and wine so everybody's web uh, a web meeting and everybody have a glass of wine and then open discussion. <laughs> yeah, some things are universal. I picked up on that. So I started smiling. Vino veritas, né? You speak the truth when you drink some wine. <laughs> True serum, that's right. True serum. Então tá, eu vou fazer a abertura como todas as semanas. A gente já passou aí de quase 50 participantes do, do evento agora e as pessoas ainda estão fazendo login. Mas grande parte do, dos, dos participantes já teve em outras uh, sessões. Essa, esse é o sexto módulo do nosso curso. Uh, é um dia muito especial para mim, não só por conta de ser o último, né? E a gente realmente dá uma relaxada quando a gente vê a nossa construção finalizada, né? Como um bom engenheiro, ele termina só é, quando a, as chaves da casa estão entregues, né? Quando a obra realmente está entregue e essa, esse é um momento especial para a gente. A gente conseguiu chegar no nosso sexto módulo sem nenhuma intercorrência, com um público assíduo, participante... E eu preciso né, é, é, agradecer realmente a todo mundo que esteve envolvido nessa organização. Não é fácil organizar um evento como esse, principalmente é, com módulos consecutivos, com a duração que a gente planejou, duas horas, para todo mundo que participou, não só como palestrante, como participante, é, sabe o esforço individual para fazer isso acontecer. Então, para agradecer especialmente a todos os participantes que fizeram possível o evento, uh, a todos os palestrantes que dedicaram o seu tempo e, e dedicaram também o seu conhecimento, uh, compartilharam de maneira generosa conosco. Queria agradecer em especial aos patrocinadores, né, para que esse evento fosse um evento gratuito, que esse fosse um evento uh, né, é, é, voltado realmente para a educação médica de forma generosa. A gente contou com a participação de alguns pa é, é, patrocinadores e eu gostaria é, nominalmente de agradecer cada um deles, não só o patrocinador do módulo de hoje, que é a Medtronic, mas também aos patrocinadores de outros módulos, como a plataforma Amigo, que patrocinou a gente no, no módulo de telemedicina, a plataforma de telemedicina e de gestão de clínicas médicas, como o Alphatec, 
em nome especial do Dr. Pimenta também, né? Agradecer essa essa colaboração da Alfatec uh, e agradecer a Nuvezio pela participação também como como patrocinador em todos os nossos eventos do BSSG. Hoje também um momento especial não só pela concretização desse resultado, né? Da nossa da nossa jornada para o BSSG, mas também um momento de bastante agradecimento e felicidade por nós termos o palestrante, o doutor Luiz Pimenta, que não só membro e fundador do Instituto de Patologia da Coluna, é um pioneiro aí na área dele, então para a gente é um orgulho grande poder contar né, com, com alguém é, que faz parte dos dois lados dessa moeda, né, da organização e, e do participante como palestrante. É, vou dar sequência, então, com a apresentação dos módulos, como eu faço toda semana. Hoje é o último módulo, então, é o avanço da era 4.0, as perspectivas cirúrgicas, realmente, do, do que é esse impacto tecnológico na medicina e para cada vertente da, da cirurgia da coluna em específico. É, mais uma vez, falar do, das ferramentas de interação. Então, a ferramenta Levante a Mão, ao final de cada apresentação, a gente abre uma sessão de perguntas que podem ser direcionadas direto aos palestrantes. Se alguém tiver interesse em alguma pergunta direta que faça, eu não compartilhei minha tela, né? Acho que agora sim. Então, de novo, né? hoje é o dia 10, dia cirurgia da coluna na era 4.0. Perdão aí pelo não compartilhamento. E as, as dicas de utilização da ferramenta, a gente tem a ferramenta Bate-Papo, que é uma, uma região de conversa informal, ou seja, é interação, é networking, é, é, é livre aí para todo mundo usar de maneira responsável. A ferramenta QIA é a ferramenta destinada para perguntas, tanto para a organização quanto para os palestrantes. Então, se possível, essas perguntas se forem direcionadas a quem elas são, ajuda bastante nas respostas. E a gente vai responder por texto ou, eventualmente, de forma verbal durante as apresentações, as perguntas chegarem por aqui. E para aqueles é, participantes que quiserem fazer uma pergunta formal, uma pergunta direta a alguma das, dos apresentadores, a gente abre sempre alguma sessão de perguntas após cada apresentação e aí é só levantar a mão, a gente vai abrir o áudio dessa pessoa que levantou a mão e essa pessoa pode fazer uma pergunta direta para algum dos palestrantes. Lembrando que todo esse evento foi um evento de é, coleta de fundos para uma instituição de caridade, a gente escolheu a Fiocruz, a Fundação Oswaldo Cruz, numa campanha específica do combate ao Covid. Então, para todos os, os palestrantes ou para todos os participantes que quiserem e puderem colaborar com alguma quantia, só direciona o celular aí para o QR Code na tela e ele vai te direcionar diretamente para pro, pro, a plataforma de coleta. E, mais uma vez, agradecendo a todos, a comissão organizadora, aos palestrantes, eu vou passar a palavra aí ao nosso nossos moderadores, para dar início no programa. Boa noite a todos. Rodrigo, mais uma vez, eu, eu não sei se eu estou correto, sou eu mesmo, não é isso, Rodrigo? É só para não atrapalhar, né? É... <risos> que a gente ficou naquela discussão e eu, eu terminei me perdendo. Boa noite a todos. É... Acrescentando aí o que o Rodrigo falou, realmente foi uma experiência diferente, né? o primeiro evento totalmente online do BSSG, a gente vinha de uma experiência muito boa do ano passado, do, 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 em 2019 e 2020, fez com que a gente se adaptasse e mudasse a nossa programação. Né? Enfim, eu acho que 2020 antecipou muitas tendências do mundo em todas as áreas e na medicina não foi diferente. Muitas coisas que a gente achava que ia estar fazendo daqui a 5, 6, 10 anos, a gente está fazendo hoje e talvez o ano que vem. Então, seguindo o nosso programa, sem mais delongas aqui, é... eu queria apresentar o palestrante, o primeiro palestrante da noite. É, é um palestrante que, 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 que conseguiu aí tapar um buraco pesadíssimo e de forma excelente. A gente tem muito a agradecer ainda mais por isso, que é o Davi, que, que é um cara... É, na América Latina, talvez seja um dos três ou quatro nomes mais exponentes da cirurgia endoscópica de coluna. É um cara jovem, da geração da gente. Eu acredito ainda que é ainda mais novo né, que, que alguns daqui. 
É, eu vi o Davi aí embarcar naquele, naquele programa do, da SBC para a Coreia. Eu já era membro da SBC e, e, e realmente fiquei muito, 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 muito empolgado com, com, com a trajetória dele. Então, Davi, obrigado por ter aceitado o convite. Desculpa por ter sido de última hora e seja bem-vindo aí a esse evento do BSSG. O Davi vai falar sobre as perspectivas futuras da cirurgia endoscópica, né? o, que, que, o que, que a gente vai estar tá fazendo daqui a 5, 10 anos em relação especificamente à cirurgia endoscópica, qual a limitação da cirurgia endoscópica, será que a cirurgia endoscópica é só para uma descompressão de raiz, o que, que é isso? Eu queria escutar isso aí de quem tem muita bagagem com isso aí. Obrigado, Davi. Antes de tudo, gostaria de agradecer esse convite, Carlos, é... Muito obrigado, é uma honra estar aqui nesse grupo, no grupo de vocês, junto com o Dr. Pimenta, com o Rodrigão, com o Fernando Herreiro, com o Murilo Dyer, com o Pratali, com todo esse grupo fortíssimo aí. É, só tenho a agradecer pelo, pelo convite de vocês. É sempre desafiador né, apresentar uma, a, a técnica que eu defendo muito, que eu preconizo, num grupo assim tão forte né, como o de vocês. Então, a, o tema da, da minha aula que foi passado foi das perspectivas futuras né, na endoscopia de coluna. E o que eu vou falar um pouquinho do momento atual né, da, da cirurgia endoscópica da coluna e as perspectivas futuras em, com relação à tecnologia, né, o desenvolvimento das tecnologias novas, com relação ao avanço das técnicas, né, do aspecto humano, né, do, da utilização do, do instrumento do treinamento, né, evolução, o que a gente espera para poder formar mais cirurgiões de forma adequada e segura, né, para que eles possam executar a endoscopia. E vou discutir um pouquinho do, 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 do tema econômico. Né? Na verdade, só abrir uma discussão e depois, eventualmente, se vocês quiserem prolongar depois. Eu gostaria de começar dando a definição que é endoscopia de coluna. Na verdade, não é nada mais do que um conjunto de ferramentas que tem o objetivo de tratar as doenças da coluna através, através de um sistema de vídeo. Ponto. É isso daí. Tem pessoas que querem já romantizar, falar que é uma arte, não sei nada. É um conjunto de ferramentas para resolver problemas da coluna. Ponto. Então, o instrumento principal da endoscopia de coluna, como todos vocês sabem, é a ótica. Né? A ótica é composta né, por um canal de trabalho. Né? Esse canal de trabalho, além do canal de trabalho, a gente tem um, um, a, a parte visual das óticas, né? a sequência das lentes, por aqui que entram as imagens. E o canal de trabalho, a gente introduz os instrumentos e os canais de, de inflow, né? de irrigação e, e de escoamento do, do soro. Tá? Nós temos hoje diversos tipos de óticas, diversos tamanhos, aí a, a, o comprimento da haste varia de ótica para ótica, então, da, da mesma forma como o diâmetro das óticas. A gente sabe que ultimamente tem saído vários tipos que são empregados para as estenoses de canal, então são óticas que têm uma, um comprimento, são um pouco mais curtas, mas por outro lado são óticas mais grossas, que têm um canal de trabalho um pouquinho maior. Tá? E tem óticas menores, as óticas cervicais não tem tanta necessidade de ter um canal de trabalho amplo, então são óticas mais curtas também e com uma, 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 um canal de trabalho mais, um diâmetro mais curto, né? As óticas têm ângulos de visão que variam, né, de 15 a 30 graus. Geralmente as óticas de interlaminar são mais próximas do zero, 15 graus, e as óticas de transforaminal mais próximas de 25, 30 graus. Em seguida a gente tem as câmeras, né, e um sistema de decodificador de imagens, né, que transmite tudo, né, para um monitor, né, de, de Full HD geralmente. Então aqui a gente está vendo uma descompressão de uma estenose central de canal, então aqui a gente está entrando do lado esquerdo do canal, a gente vê que todo o recesso lateral está livre do lado esquerdo, a gente vê o saco dural, a gente vai para o outro lado, a gente consegue visualizar o recesso lateral contra lateral, a gente está em cima do disco contra lateral e a gente vê que o recesso está livre contra lateral. Então essa imagem é uma imagem satisfatória, a gente consegue ter uma boa resolução visual que mantém a segurança do nosso procedimento. Então, os instrumentos que a gente utiliza através dessa, da nossa cânula de trabalho, do, do canal de trabalho, né? Então, são instrumentos geralmente mais longos, mais finos, né? Mas que se, se assemelham muito, apesar de ser mais finos, aos instrumentos que a gente utiliza para cirurgia aberta tradicional, tá? Bom, os acessos endoscópicos têm sido aplicados, né? Tradicionalmente para problemas na coluna lombar, mas têm sido expandidos para tratar problemas na torácica e na cervical também, né? Os principais acessos que a gente conhece é o transforaminal, que é o mais antigo de todos, o interlaminar e o pós-lateral, 
que é né, destinado mais a afecções do forame, né? Então, qual a diferença entre eles? Né? O pessoal costuma confundir muito o que é um acesso transforaminal do acesso pós-lateral. O acesso transforaminal, o próprio nome diz, transforaminal, ele atravessa o forame para resolver problemas dentro do canal. Então, geralmente, o nosso ponto de entrada é, se situa entre 10 a 14 centímetros da linha mediana e nosso ângulo de ataque ao forame, né, ao disco, em torno de 25 graus em relação ao solo, tá? O acesso pós-lateral já é um acesso que não tem finalidade de tratar problemas de dentro do canal. A gente vai tratar afecções do forame, sejam elas hérnias foraminais ou seja elas estenoses foraminais. Tá? Então, o nosso ângulo de ataque é um pouco mais verticalizado, então em torno de 45 graus, sendo que nosso ponto de entrada varia entre 7 e 9 centímetros da linha mediana. Já o acesso interlaminar é o nosso acesso que mais se assemelha às cirurgias micro, é, microcirúrgicas convencionais. Ele é um acesso é, é, exatamente posterior e a gente entra entre as lâminas. Tá? E ela permite também o um acesso, a possibilidade de acessar o lado contralateral, né? mesmo fazendo um acesso uniportal e chegar, que vocês viram no vídeo anterior, a gente fazer as descompressões contralaterais, dos recessos contralaterais. Tá? Então... Na evolução da técnica, na verdade, a primeira, um primeiro dos acessos descritos e o mais tradicional, o mais convencional, que na verdade na curva de aprendizado, o primeiro que todos aprendem é o acesso transforaminal. Ele é descrito desde os anos 70, óbvio, não com sistemas de ótica que são utilizados atualmente, né? o Regicato utilizava, na verdade, ele se guiava, colocava um, uma cânula de Craig no disco guiado pelo radioscopia, em seguida ele entrava com pinças de disco, removia o disco, né? a cega só sendo guiado pela, pela radioscopia. Obviamente, tudo isso daí evoluiu com a introdução das óticas, dos sistemas de, de imagem. Né? Mas o acesso transforaminal, que eu quero dizer que ele depende fundamentalmente de uma boa técnica de punção. Fazendo uma boa punção, posicionando bem a cânula de trabalho através de uma boa punção, a gente consegue, na maioria das vezes, quando a gente tem uma, uma, uma boa indicação, realizar uma descompressão, fazer uma disectomia precisa, né? Inclusive, a técnica transforaminal ela tem um fácil manuseio. Então, para o cirurgião que é principiante, uma vez que ele sabe colocar bem a cânula de trabalho, posicionar atrás da hérnia de disco, ele consegue remover a hérnia sem maiores dificuldades. Só que tem um problema. A técnica transforaminal, ela é, esteve envolvida né, ao longo do, do, do tempo, dependendo do tipo de indicação, com casos, né, situações em que ocorria a remoção incompleta de uma hernia de disco, em casos que é, se questiona se aumenta o número de recorrência, né, de recidivas das hernias discais, e mesmo pacientes que você remove adequadamente a hérnia, que permaneçam com, a, com sintomas, né, que, é, que permaneçam sintomáticos. Em 2015, uh, o Choi pre, é, apresentou um estudo muito interessante que ele revisou 10 mil, mais de 10 mil casos né, que foram acessados pela via transforaminal. Né? E ele observou né, que, especialmente em dois casos específicos, que tinham maior risco de remoção incompleta. O primeiro era em pacientes com hérnias centrais volumosas, como esse que a gente está vendo aqui na figura. Né? Você entra por um acesso transforaminal, muitas vezes você consegue tirar o disco subanular mas permanece o um fragmento extruso central, né? Você não consegue, o acesso transformador não consegue, muitas vezes, acessar esse fragmento mais centralizado e volumoso, né? Fica uma, um fragmento remanescente. E hérnias migradas para caudal. Né? Então, aqui a gente vê um, um, um outro caso de uma, de, uma, de uma hérnia migrada caudal, né? E depois o acesso transforminal o pedículo acaba configurando um obstáculo para acessar esse fragmento extruso, né, que fica muitas vezes justa a pedicular medial, e o paciente continua assintomático. Outro problema é a recorrência, né, então o acesso transforminal. Apesar da maioria da literatura falar que existe uma equiparidade na incidência de recorrências na técnica aberta e na endoscópica, né, no, particularmente no transforminal, gira em torno de 3% a 20%, mas fica incerto. Em alguns casos que ocorrem nas equipes, na verdade, nos colegas que fazem né, o acesso transforminal, pacientes que têm a recorrência precoce. Então, o que é uma recorrência precoce? É realmente uma recorrência? O paciente tem um disco muito instável e acabou tendo uma recidiva? Ou se trata de uma remoção incompleta? 
para incapacidade de remover talvez fragmentos soltos dentro do disco. É uma questão questionável, ainda é um tema de muito debate na, nos congressos e nos cursos de, de endoscopia. Já as recorrências tardias se devem mais a um processo, né, o um processo degenerativo do, do disco, e cada paciente tem um ritmo de degeneração diferente, isso daí geralmente, tanto a recorrência vai acontecer, tanto na técnica aberta quanto na técnica endoscópica, da mesma forma. Tá? Nossa experiência pessoal na nossa equipe é que o índice de recorrência gira em torno de 11% o processo transforaminal. Tá? Então, esse aqui é uma, um paciente que teve uma hérnia de disco, L4, L5, né, que a gente fez um acesso transforaminal e, e teve uma evolução muito boa, só que dois meses depois ele veio com, esse, com essa imagem. Né? Ele teve uma reagudização da dor, a dor era até mais intensa do que no pré-operatório né, da primeira cirurgia. E apareceu com essa imagem. Né? Esse foi um paciente que a gente revisou por vídeo também e teve uma boa evolução. Tá? E existem, por fim, casos né, de pacientes que permanecem com dor, mesmo você tendo é, é, retirado, tendo removido toda a hérnia de forma adequada. Então, a nossa, nossa posição é que a gente precisa tomar muito cuidado com os casos de pacientes que têm estenose do recesso lateral. Né? Por exemplo, aqui a gente vê um paciente que tem uma hipertrofia facetária uma hipertrofia do ligamento amarelo do lado esquerdo que contribui né, com a estenose, com a compressão posterior né, da raiz de L5. Tá? Esse aqui é um paciente de 85 anos. Então, a gente fazendo um acesso transforminante consegue tirar o bulging do disco, a hérnia de disco, a gente consegue. Mas essa parte posterior, lógico, isso daqui também é um tema de muito debate. Tem colegas que preconizam acesso transforminal para fazer uma formioplastia, ampliar o recesso lateral. Então, o nosso ver o melhor acesso para descompressão do recesso lateral é interlaminar. Então, a gente teve experiência de alguns casos que tinham esse tema do recesso lateral, você faz o acesso transformacional e você não descomprime adequadamente o recesso. Tá? Fiz aqui outro caso, outro exemplo, né? então a raiz fica aqui presa né? pela hipertrofia um pouco do, do, da, da faceta, né? do processo articular superior, e esse é um caso que corre o risco também com um paciente de permanecer com dor se escolher o acesso transforminal. Tá? E outros casos, né, pacientes com estenose central, estenose congênita, como esse daqui, ele tem uma hernia discal central, tudo bem, mas ele tem uma estenose importante de canal. Então, não adianta eu fazer um acesso transforminal somente nele, que eu, ele, sem dúvida, vai permanecer com dor, provavelmente vai continuar sintomático. Né? Então, a nossa cirurgia é sempre com isso. Isso aqui, mais ou menos, é a, isso aqui é a visualização endoscópica do acesso transforminal. Tá? Uma vez colocada a cânula de trabalho, a gente cai dentro do disco, né? a gente pega nesse disco com, com, com a pinça forceps, né? com a pinça de disco, remove a hernia, uma vez que a gente entra de novo com, com a ótica, a gente consegue ver acima da linha do Equador, a gente consegue ver a raiz livre, a gente consegue ver o canal livre pelo menos. Algumas vezes a gente não vê a raiz, algumas vezes a gente vê é, um tecido gorduroso flutuante em cima do Equador, né? O Equador configura, na verdade, o limite entre o espaço discal para baixo e o canal vertebral para cima. Então, quando a gente vê tecido epidural flutuando livre acima do Equador, da, da, da nossa visualização da cana de trabalho, a gente considera a, a cirurgia é, é, satisfatória, né? a descompressão satisfatória. Só existe um problema que a gente não consegue ter uma visualização adequada para essa transforminal se a gente tem uma migração caudal de alto grau, ou se a gente tem uma migração cranial de alto grau, ou se a gente tem alguma compressão posterior. O acesso transforminal não permite que a gente tenha essa visualização completa. Tá? Então, qual que é a solução? Né? Então, a gente tem, essas, tem esses três problemas né, inerentes ao acesso transforminal em casos um pouco mais complexos. Né? Então, a gente tem observado que acesso interlaminar tem nos dado, tem sido uma solução é muito interessante para esses casos específicos, né? Então, quais são as, é, qual, qual a característica clássica do acesso interlaminar? Ele é um acesso que, do ponto de vista visual, ele é mais familiar ao cirurgião de coluna, né? Ele está mais habituado a visualizar o canal de trás para frente do que ver de lado, né? Do que quando ele entra pelo pelo forame. E a navegação pelo acesso interlaminar, ele permite uma melhor visualização dentro do canal. Então, em casos complexos, com migrações de alto grau, você consegue navegar para cranial e para caudal, procurando eventuais fragmentos perdidos ou sequestro de disco. E então, quando você navega bem, quando você tem uma melhor visualização 
por trás do canal vertebral e sabe que pela frente dele você já removeu todo o disco ou todo aquele material discal que eventualmente faz uma compressão no tecido neural, você se sente, o cirurgião se sente mais satisfeito quanto ao sucesso da cirurgia dele. Só que tem um problema. Por outro lado, o acesso interlaminar ele exige um pouquinho mais de treinamento. Então, o manuseio, né, isso que eu, que eu, aquilo que eu falei, se por um lado o acesso transforaminal ele é mais fácil de manusear os instrumentos, a interlaminar, a ótica, a cânula de trabalho ficam totalmente soltas e elas ficam livres para manuseio pelo, pela mão não dominante do cirurgião. Tá? Então isso daí é a principal dificuldade que a maioria dos colegas em treinamento que estão na fase de aprendizado tem. Tá? Então aqui a gente tem um caso de um paciente do sexo masculino, tá? 50 anos, ele tem uma hérnia discal, centro lateral clássica, está do lado esquerdo, só que ele já tem uma hipertrofia também do, do, da faceta, uma hipertrofia facetária e um pouco do ligamento amarelo, que contribui para uma estenose do recesso lateral. Então, esse caso a gente considerou mais adequado um acesso interlaminar. Então, esse daqui é o vídeo da cirurgia, né? Então, a gente removendo, né, limpando a janela interlaminar, aqui a gente já pode ver o ligamento amarelo aqui no meio e aqui à esquerda, a, a borda medial do processo articular inferior, né, do lado esquerdo. Então, a gente entra com o drill, a gente amplia a nossa janela interlaminar, então a gente está é, é, drilando o processo articular inferior de L4. Em seguida, a gente começa a ver a lâmina aqui embaixo, a lâmina de L5 e o processo articular superior de L5. Então, com isso, a gente amplia a, a nossa janela interlaminar. Em seguida, a gente entra com a tesoura, a gente começa a fazer a flavectomia. A gente está ampliando a nossa janela interlaminar, então agora a gente está cortando, tirando o ligamento amarelo com a tesoura e com a Kerrison também. E a gente faz essa ampliação do canal até que a gente consiga visualizar de forma adequada o ombro da raiz. Então, uma vez que a gente tirou a gordura peridural, a gente consegue visualizar o ombro da raiz. Né? Então, é esse é o momento seguro que a gente pode manipular esse tecido. Né? Então, a gente vem aqui no ombro, entra com uma espátula, e a técnica é muito semelhante à técnica convencional, então afasta o nervo para medial, entra com a cana de trabalho, a gente faz a rotação da cana de trabalho que é biselada, e expõe a área de disco. Então, a gente está em cima da, da área do paciente, aí é só fazer a remoção do fragmento extruso. Tá? Então, esse é um procedimento que a gente começa fazendo uma descompressão do recesso, fazendo a drilagem do processo articular inferior, a gente drila o processo articular superior da vértebra caudal, faz a descompressão e aí a gente consegue ver, consegue visualizar de forma adequada uma descompressão, uma boa descompressão da raiz descendente de L5. Então, não temos mais hérnia anterior a ela, e o que estava no dorso dela, a gente removeu com o drill. Então, voltando à nossa questão, qual é a solução? Né? Então, nos casos de remoção incompleta e dor persistente, a partir do momento que a gente começou a utilizar o acesso interlaminar, a gente começou a ter uma, a gente observou uma redução significativa nos casos é, de resultados insatisfatórios. E mesmo o índice de recorrência né, com acesso interlaminar caiu. Na nossa equipe, de que variava em torno de 11% com acesso transforaminal, passou a ser em torno de 5% pelo acesso interlaminal. Bom, então, resumindo para vocês, a gente tem que na endoscopia de coluna a gente tem esses três acessos principais, só que com o passar dos anos, com a nossa experiência, a gente observou que o acesso interlaminar, talvez ele tenha uma maior relevância, a gente tenha que investir um pouquinho mais nele, no treinamento de novos cirurgiões em cima do acesso interlaminar, porque ele é o mais versátil de todos. A gente corre menos risco de errar, ou menos risco de ter complicações, quando a gente vai acessar é, ou a, indicar a endoscopia para afecções de dentro do canal. tá? Aquilo que é, as afecções, as estenoses e as hérnias foraminais, o acesso postolateral continua sendo o melhor acesso. Então, é, entrando no, no tema sobre as perspectivas futuras, né, quanto à tecnologia, a gente tem observado nos últimos anos né, a fabricação por diversas é, empresas né, de diversos tipos de endoscópio. Né? Então, a gente tem os tipos, né, já comentei para vocês, para acesso cervical, que são mais finas e curtas, os tipos de endoscópios para acesso para as estenoses de canal lombar, que são curtas também, só que, que tem um canal de, de, de trabalho mais grosso, as óticas convencionais, as mais tradicionais, esse tipo de ótica mais antiga, que é processo transformacional, que são óticas mais longas, né? e que tem um canal de trabalho intermediário. 
Então, tem, tem várias empresas com diversos, cada empresa tem um diverso especifica, especifica, especificações muito particulares né, deles sobre diâmetro do, do, do canal de trabalho, sobre comprimento do, do, da, da, da ótica. Então, isso varia, né? cada cirurgião acaba tendo é, suas preferências e indicando aquilo que ele acha mais conveniente. Né? Aqui são outros exemplos né, de óticas de outras empresas, essa daqui da Ritos Pai, também uma ótica de excelente qualidade. E a gente observou também né, o aumento do portfólio né, de instrumentais. Então, a gente vê diversos tipos de, de, de pinças love de todos os tamanhos, né? É, tesouras de todos os tipos e ângulos, né? Kerrinsons também, agora com os canais de trabalho mais de diâmetro maior, a gente pode utilizar Kerrinsons maiores e mais robustas também para casos mais complexos, né? De estenoses um pouquinho mais é, importantes, né? Da, na região lombar. Então, a gente tem observado nos últimos anos uma evolução muito grande, né? Da qualidade, na qualidade, no tipo de instrumentais de utilizados, né? Isso daqui é um cautério bipolar muito forte, né? Que a, que a Rivos Pine lançou recentemente aqui, também a gama de brocas, né? Brocas cortantes com proteção e sem proteção, brocas diamantada, todo tipo de brocas, até brocas com angulação, né? O que facilita, por exemplo, no acesso, é, na descompressão over the top e contralateral, são brocas que ajudam muito também, né? E uma coisa que a gente tem observado, né? E a tendência de, da, da endoscopia de coluna é que os sistemas né? de interpretação de imagem, né? as óticas, né? as qualidades de imagem, é, e os monitores, aqui a gente vê um monitor 4K com uma tela grande, então a gente tem pressão muitas vezes que o cirurgião está dentro da coluna do paciente, né? tanto que é o nível de resolução das imagens. Né? E existem óticas que estão, já foram lançadas né, para cirurgias abdominais que tem a tecnologia 3D. Né? Então, isso talvez demore um pouquinho para chegar para a coluna, uma vez que o canal de trabalho ocupa já bastante espaço no diâmetro da ótica. Né? Então, você... É, adicionar tecnologia 3D, você tem que colocar duas dois canais de lentes, né? o que acabaria aumentando bastante o diâmetro do, do, da, da ótica utilizada. E é, uma, do ponto de vista da, 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 da tecnológico, a gente tem usado, né, em casos complexos, né, a monitoração neurofisiológica. Né? Então, principalmente em locais, né, em cirurgias em que a gente passa perto da medula, como nas descompressões cervicais e torácicas, né? e pacientes que têm doença degenerativa em múltiplos níveis. Então, muitas vezes, alguns pacientes, eles têm compressões em múltiplos níveis, mas vamos supor, mas ele tem uma estenose de canal importante, L4, L5, e tem uma estenose leve dos restos laterais, ou que você está na dúvida, L3, L4, aí você fica na dúvida se você descomprime os dois níveis no mesmo tempo cirúrgico, você já pode é, fazer uma descompressão simples do nível mais complexo, do nível mais estenosado, então, a monitoração neurofisiológica nos ajudou muito a dar essas respostas, né? É, e tem a situação da, de, 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 de punção em forames estenóticos também, quando o, o, o cirurgião tem medo de fazer uma punção um acesso que eventualmente possa colocar em risco a raiz emergente. Então, é, a monitoração neurofisiológica também é uma alternativa muito interessante para aqueles é, cirurgiões que não se sentem confortáveis em fazer a cirurgia com anestesia local e sedação. Tá, então, na nossa prática, a gente tem chamado a equipe do Dr. Ricardo Ferreira, ele pessoalmente tem vindo na maior parte das cirurgias, e nesses casos que eu citei, assim, foi de, 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 de grande ajuda, mudando muitas vezes no curso da cirurgia, às vezes a gente acaba ampliando no nosso, no nosso planejamento uma descompressão, a gente acaba uh, descomprimindo um nível adicional, ou algum, o casos que a gente acreditava que precisaria fazer descompressão de dois níveis, é de descomprimir um nível só, o paciente ficou excelente, manteve o resultado ótimo, diminuindo a morbidade da cirurgia. Aqui tem outros, do ponto de vista tecnológico, né? tem outros estudos que foram publicados na, nos últimos anos. né? Então, esse estudo particularmente, que foi publicado em 2019, ele fala sobre esse avanço, exatamente que eu estava falando agora, né? sobre o avanço da tecnologia de imagem, né? sobre as óticas, né? o, o, o tipo de... De, de lentes que é usado, a tecnologia que é usado para melhorar a vedação das lentes, né, que só passam por um processo, as lentes, na verdade, as óticas passam por um processo de, 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 de quando passam por um processo de, de esterilização, acabam sofrendo muito né, com é, 
em temperaturas elevadas, com vapor em muito alta temperatura, o que acaba fazendo com que elas durem muito menos, aumentando o custo da cirurgia. Né? Então, nesse sentido, eles falaram que a nanotecnologia tem é, trazido talvez algumas vantagens no sentido de trazer avanços tecnológicos na fabricação de óticas de forma a deixá-las um pouco mais robustas. Né? Ele menciona também nesse artigo a vantagem da inteligência artificial de fazer uma interface né, entre os exames de imagem e, 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 e o acesso endoscópico no, no, no intraoperatório na sala de cirurgia. Aqui esse daqui é um artigo chinês que falou, é, eles falam, né, eles têm usado a navegação para fazer a punção e o posicionamento da cana de trabalho em forames assim complexos, eles falam que eles mantiveram a segurança da cirurgia e conseguiram fazer as punções em tempos menores, né, conseguiram encurtar Uh, o tempo de cirurgia. Aqui um, um, um estudo muito semelhante, só que eles fizeram, é, aplicaram em cadáver e eles têm um frame para posicionamento da, da cana de trabalho, então esse frame ele direciona a cana de trabalho direto de acordo com aquilo que foi planejado no, 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 na, no, no planejamento da, da navegação. E esse aqui, um outro estudo também que fala um pouco sobre a robótica né, no acesso transformacional, de forma que o robô ele faz o acesso seguindo aquilo que foi predeterminado pela navegação, isto é, o cirurgião determina qual que é o, qual que é a trajetória, que é cânula de trabalho, o dilatador é cânula de trabalho, tem que fazer para não machucar a raiz, para pelo menos poder ter um bom acesso seguro e, e que ele consiga tirar ele de disco, então aqui está o braço do robô reproduzindo aquilo que o, o, que o cirurgião determinou no, no software, né? E existem outras tecnologias que estão, é, bom, pelo menos estão sendo publicadas, né? Então, a capacidade de um cirurgião operar remotamente utilizando a tecnologia 5G. Então, ele vai no robô e ele consegue, a quilômetros de distância, manipular, fazer um procedimento na coluna de um paciente que, eventualmente, está em outra cidade, outro estado, outro país. É, mas isso depende muito também da tecnologia de, 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 de dados, né? Da tecnologia 5G. Quanto à técnica, as perspectivas futuras quanto à técnica, nós temos aquilo que inicialmente foi descrito para o acesso exclusivamente às hernias discais, a gente tem observado uma evolução das indicações graças à evolução da tecnologia, né, da fabricação dos instrumentais para as estenoses foraminais, estenoses do recesso lateral, estenoses centrais, tudo seguindo uma curva de aprendizado. Né? Então, todo cirurgião que é, vai pegando, vai é, ficando familiar os instrumentais, a forma de acessar, ele consegue também é, modificar o nível de indicação para o acesso endoscópico. Né? E da mesma forma, ele pode começar a indicar para outros tipos de problemas, outros tipos de diagnósticos, como hernias torácicas, hernias cervicais, estenoses torácicas, estenoses cervicais, inclusive outras doenças, obviamente, com, é, guardando as devidas proporções, né, as indicações salvando casos em que existam instabilidades, por exemplo, como nas espondilodicites, né? e mesmo alguns tipos de tumor, por exemplo, é, tumores benignos como pequenos osteomas osteoides, na, que estão no arco posterior, né? ou casos de, de é, metástase, isso já aconteceu com a gente, metástases metástase do corpo vertebral que invadem um forame, o paciente tem com muita dor, paciente com pouco prognóstico, múltiplas metástases, pelo menos a gente consegue dar qualidade de vida descomprimindo o forame e fazendo uma descompressão percutânea. Né? Então, é assim, é assim, aqui ficam algumas perspectivas de, de utilização da endoscopia de coluna. Né? Quanto ao treinamento né, dos colegas, né, o objetivo principal que a gente tem é, ultimamente é encurtar a curva de aprendizado. Né? A gente sabe que é um pouco complexo, né, o que o objetivo da Maria do, do, dos colegas que já vem executando a técnica é fazer com que ela se torne acessível à maioria dos cirurgiões, né? Então que a gente consiga aumentar o número de centros de formação, né? E que isso consiga também ajudar na redução dos custos, né? Hoje em dia, será que querer fazer um curso de endoscopia de coluna isso daí custa caro? Né? Então o objetivo é que a gente consiga pelo menos ajudar. É, isso daqui são os nossos nossos residentes lá na escola por exemplo, de medicina, né? A gente tem cursos né, lá dentro, lá da escola, na, na, na técnica operatória. Isso aqui é o curso do IRCAD, né, aqui o Lubers, que é o convidado de vocês. Isso aqui é o curso do IRCAD, também a gente tem um cadáver lab muito interessante lá, só que assim, é né, um centro em barretos, né, um local de, é, talvez um pouco difícil acesso. Né. 
E aqui a gente tem outros módulos, né? outras formas de é, que já foi discutido de, de treinamento de cirurgiões, né? utilizando é, realidade virtual. Isso daqui, obviamente, é um pouco caro. Então, esse estudo mostrou que é uma forma efetiva de você treinar e deixar o cirurgião familiarizado, um pouco mais familiarizado com a técnica. Né? E aqui eu deixo em aberto né, as perspectivas futuras quanto ao fator econômico, que não adianta nada na verdade, avançar na tecnologia, na fabricação desses equipamentos, se o procedimento não for custo efetivo. Né? Não adianta eu fazer uma cirurgia maravilhosa com navegação, com robótica, para o Merne é simples, L5S1, é que eu consigo resolver né, uma cirurgia de 20 minutos de forma segura, sem é, precisar encarecer demais esse procedimento. Né? A gente tem que sabe, ter um bom senso de saber em que momento aplicar essa tecnologia, em que momento eu posso justificar o, 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 um custo mais elevado dessa tecnologia. Né? E a gente depende também de fatores econômicos locais. A gente mora num país que a gente depende de certas situações, de, da situação financeira do país, da cotação do dólar, por exemplo, no momento que o dólar quase bateu 6, a maioria das empresas de material falava, olha, vai ser impossível importar uma ótica, uma ótica que custa, no mercado externo, 10 mil dólares, custar 60 mil reais aqui no Brasil. Então, inviabiliza né, a, a expansão e, o, e, o, e a utilização da endoscopia na, na, no nosso sistema atual, né, no sistema de saúde atual. Bom, é, mas isso que eu queria... Essa, essas ideias que eu queria ter passado para vocês. Agradeço novamente o convite. Né? Muito obrigado a todos e fico aberto aqui as perguntas e as dúvidas do, dos participantes. Davi, obrigado. Foi muito boa a sua explanação. A gente tem um bocado de perguntas. Na realidade, a gente está aqui paralelamente ao, ao Zoom. A gente está pelo WhatsApp recebendo algumas perguntas. Tem bastante pergunta. Eu, eu, vou, eu vou tentar fazer... Eu vou tentar abrir para duas perguntas ou três, porque a gente estourou um pouquinho o tempo, mas eu queria te pedir antecipadamente para ver se você consegue ficar online, que no final a gente abre um, um, um tempozinho de discussão entre todas as pessoas. E confesso que essa parte de endoscopia é, é bastante é interessante para a gente, principalmente que a maioria dos cirurgiões que aqui estão lidam mais com, com a questão da deformidade e surgem algumas dúvidas que podem parecer básicas. Eu queria fazer uma pergunta, eu vou, eu vou fazer uma pergunta rápida, depois vou pedir para o Rodrigo também fazer uma pergunta, e a gente continua e no final a gente questiona um pouco mais para você. É, como esse curso, Davi, é um curso de futuro, de perspectivas futuras, da gente entender, é, eu particularmente, eu, eu faço endoscopia, eu acho fantástica a técnica, se bem indicada, se bem feita, tudo isso, mas a, a pergunta que eu, que eu sempre me faço, eu queria te fazer isso como um cara muito uma bagagem infinitamente maior, é o seguinte, você falou, olha, a curva de aprendizado a gente vai fazer com uma hérnia simples e a gente vai chegando para uma descompressão lombar, uma descompressão torácica, uma descompressão cervical. A pergunta que eu quero fazer é, endoscopia se resume a uma cirurgia descompressiva ou, ou há outras perspectivas? Eu vi há 5, 10 anos atrás, no começo da endoscopia, mais ou menos, o pessoal falando de cages expansivos que passariam dentro da ótica. Eu vejo uma tendência hoje, algumas pessoas falando aí, reverberando sobre cages, já estou vendo trabalho sobre cages facetários, que se coloca através da faceta, se expande e se promove uma artrodese através disso. Então, eu queria escutar de você. A cirurgia endoscópica de coluna se restringe a uma cirurgia descompressiva ou você vê um futuro diferente? É... Eu não diria que se resume só a uma descompressão. Olha, lógico, essencialmente é uma cirurgia descompressiva, mas você tem casos em espondilos de cites, por exemplo, que você pode drenar é, abscessos, você pode remover, fazer biópsia e coletar material para análise, é, você limpa, você la é, lava um canal, você pode ser uma cirurgia curativa, por exemplo, um paciente com osteoma, osteóide facetário. Você pode ir lá e remover, se você consegue acessar todo o nido né, desse, desse tumor benigno que é o osteoma osteóide, você resolveu o problema do paciente. Então, é uma cirurgia que tem o potencial de ser curativo, lógico. Sabendo escolher bem, né? Tem uma boa... Sabendo eleger e você sabendo suas limitações do ponto de vista de, de curva de aprendizado. Então, só que, sim, você tem razão. É essencialmente uma técnica que tem o seu é, sua indicação clássica para descompressão e quanto a, a essa tecnologia né, na verdade você tocou um ponto aqui, crucial aqui que é a colocação dos queijos né 
eu tive uma experiência ruim com os cages endoscópicos, né? Na, a primeira, primeiro cage que eu utilizei, na verdade, é muito robusto. Na verdade, você não consegue fazer uma facetectomia, pelo menos na, na época, você teria que ser, fazer uma facetectomia muito agressiva, teria que ter brocas um pouco maiores, que não tinha na ocasião, e acabei, acabei colocando esse cage por um, por um forame que eu não tinha aumentado de forma suficiente, então o paciente ficou desestésico no pós-operatório. Lógico, depois recuperou de algum tempo, mas e nunca ficou bom. E esses cages expansíveis também, né? você coloca com algum macaquinho também, eles são muito finos. Ele sempre faz subsidiência, ele sempre quebra, ele sempre fratura a placa terminal. Então, assim, não adianta para nada. Eu acho que assim, é... Tipo, só, é, é só colocar por colocar um, um queijo. O queijo, na minha opinião, se você vai fazer uma artrodeve, você vai colocar um queijo, você precisa colocar um queijo grande. Isso daí eu acho que o Rodrigo, o Dr. Pimenta, vão estar de acordo comigo. Então, não me anima, pelo menos no momento, com aquilo que a gente tem hoje em mãos, não me anima o uso de queijos pelo acesso endoscópico. Faz aberto e coloca um queijo. Ou faz um x leaf faz um alif, faz um T-Leaf, mas abre. Não tem jeito. Eu acho que se você tiver que, que artrodesar, de colocar uma caixa anterior, eu abro. Eu, eu, isso é o que eu tenho feito nos meus pacientes. Certo. E, e para eu passar para o Rodrigo, então, para terminar a, a, o questionamento, foi fantástico a sua explanação. Então, em, você falou o seguinte, é, pelo menos pelo que a gente tem em mãos hoje, perspectivas futuras, você acredita na artrodese através da endoscopia, sim ou não? E por quê? Eu passo a bola para os engenheiros das, das empresas de material, tá? Me apresenta um bom sistema, confiável, uma boa broca, um tubo que tem uma grossura que não seja nem muito grossa, nem muito fina, eu consiga colocar um cage que não vai me fraturar a placa terminal. Eu deixo esse desafio para os fabricantes, para os engenheiros aí. Se eles conseguirem me trazer um sistema confiável, vamos lá, a gente tenta, por que não? É. Rodrigo, por favor. Uh, bom, eu tinha algumas perguntas, mas eu até depois dessa discussão e do tempo, eu acho que eu vou deixar essas perguntas para o chat. Eu vou mandar. São perguntas muito pontuais, perguntas com relação à aplicação de, de navegação, a endoscopia não irrigada. Então, eu vou deixar você respondendo com a gente no chat e a gente dá sequência às próximas apresentações. Gosto mais de você ainda agora que você mostrou que entende o que é uma artrodese bem feita e o que é uma descompressão bem feita. Quem tem o primor de fazer uma descompressão como vocês fazem não pode, às vezes, querer extrapolar, sair da casinha e querer fazer uma artrodese michuruca só porque é endoscópica. Parabéns. Gosto ainda mais de você agora. É isso aí. Então, então é, Davi, eu vou te pedir mais uma vez para você ficar para o final, para a gente fazer alguns questionamentos. É, é, queria agradecer. I would like to introduce Dr. Karen Singh. He is orthopedic surgeon in the Hughes University in Chicago, and he is co-founder of the Minimally Invasive Spine Study Group. Dr. Karen, thank you for came here with us, and we are here to listen to you. All right, thank you very much. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. And can you uh, see my screen? Not yet. How about now? Mm, not yet. How about now? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's always very humbling to present new technology advancements, um, especially internationally and especially with Brazil. Uh, uh, Brazil has always been kind of at the forefront of advancement. Um, and so I'm trying to give more of an American perspective and flavor and hopefully it can apply all throughout. Um, I do want to let everyone know, as a child, I grew up, uh, my first soccer matches that I started watching were with my father. It was the 1986 World Cup. And the United States didn't really have soccer on TV. So they had it on Spanish channel. It was called Univision. And I watched it every night with my father. I was 10 years old. My father would come home late at night. And then we'd tape it and I'd watch it. And I grew up much to the dismay of all the faculty here as an Argentinian fan. So I always root Argentina 
over Brazil. I hate to say that. That's my one little factoid. Shame on you. <laughs> I know. I know. Forgive me. Um, here are my, dis my disclosures. I think this is important. I always give my disclosures. I will discuss one company of which I was a founder, um, and, and Dr. Pimenta has actually seen this technology years ago, and that'll be the very end. And I'll also, once again, repeat my disclosures at that time. So when we look at new technology, I think it's, it's, uh, it's important for us as faculty, as, as participants, as attendees to understand kind of how technology gets incorporated into your practice. In general, the way there's a, there's a saying, a Scots, it's called Scott's parabola, and there's a rise and fall of surgical technique. And basically what this means is a new technology is introduced and all of a sudden it gets traction and there's a lot of excitement. And then it becomes very much like the attempt of becoming a standard of care. And then some damaging outcomes happen, some catastrophic complications, maybe user related, maybe technology related. And then all of a sudden the technique kind of gets condemned. And then eventually there comes to a baseline adoption of it. And oftentimes we see this and particularly so in minimally invasive surgery, where there's a lot of innovation, some of it market driven, some of it industry driven, some of it surgeon driven. And then hopefully we can kind of talk about those technologies and put some perspective into them. So I grouped these technologies and innovations into biologics, implant, I'll call it computer assisted navigation, robotics, which kind of blurs the line, techniques, and they're just minor changes, perioperative management, which I think has probably the biggest impetus in the United States, at least right now, and then some, a little talk on virtual and augmented reality. And then the last uh, on quantitative imaging of which I have a conflict of interest. So biologics, I just kind of briefly go through this. As far as it stands currently in the United States, there's promise as it relates to uh, some stem cell work, some um, PRP injections have been used more so in a financial gain as opposed to anything that has any scientific merit. Most of the studies still lack any large scale randomized control trials to determine the true benefit. And right now in the United States, it's typically done as a cash paying practice or business as opposed to anything that has any evidence-based medicine behind it. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we are involved currently in an ongoing clinical trial for spinal cord injury. There's some potential um, neuronal factors that have uh, potential benefit, neuron stem cell injection directly into the cord itself. These are limited to phase two trials. Uh, there was some phase one trials with human fetal spinal cord uh, precursors that have kind of not really shown much beyond that one to two level uh, regaining of function. I briefly touch upon BMP. BMP has been around for a long time. However, recently, uh, for those who are not aware, it's been approved by the FDA for single-level ACDF and their current ongoing IDE trials uh, for BMP utilization in both open and MIS telolift surgery. It's probably the most studied biological compound that we have, uh, meaning non-iliac crest. And I could even argue at this point it probably has more data behind it than iliac crest. Uh, but the interesting thing is its expansion of uh, its utilization or where it's being used is increasing. And I mentioned BMP because it follows Scott's parabola. When BMP was first introduced, it was widely accepted. We didn't know how to dose it. We probably used it uh, inappropriate amounts in the wrong situation. And just like that curve I showed you before, a lot of catastrophic complications happened. Then there were concerns regarding medical legal issues, particularly in the United States for its, usual, for its utilization off label. And now the tide has turned and we're seeing a much more increased use of BMP in a controlled fashion at very low doses with a significant cost reduction. As far as implants have been, implants, I would put this implants and techniques, what has become very popular in the United States is cortical screws. The reason being that you can limit your exposure through a midline approach, which is very familiar to surgeons. It can be done in a very much an outpatient environment been used in situations of rescue screws and in adjacent level uh, degeneration. Also very useful in osteoporotic bone. 
it's really kind of caught wind, particularly in the Midwest. I'm not sure if it's caught wind uh, everywhere else, but definitely in the Midwest, it's become very popular. Uh, and it allows for surgeons to have a more familiar approach to quote unquote minimally invasive surgery, meaning that it's, there's no constraints of a tube. It's, a, it's the same midline decompression with the bilateral plif or bilateral T plif, I like to call it, approach uh, to the inner body space. Unfortunately, there's pars fractures, particular fractures, and oftentimes, sometimes improper end plate preparation, as can occur with MIST lift and pseudoarthroses uh, that we now are seeing um, turn or come back to us in our practice. This minimally invasive uh, or SI joint fusion was kind of cast away as a difficult diagnosis, and now it's come and it's reared its head again as a very popular procedure in the United States. Interestingly enough, it's being done by pain physicians, uh, meaning non-surgeons who are doing this. Some companies have uh, excluded the training for these non-physicians that have required a training program. Unfortunately, some have not. So we are seeing a large increase in sacroiliac joint fusions. To me, it's a very challenging uh, diagnosis to make. I'm not necessarily uh, one that uh, subscribes to this treatment just because I don't necessarily see this patient population and decipher it well. I think when when Hanjo gives his talk in adjacent level in uh, long segment fusions, I think it has some more clear etiology and diagnosis. But in my generalized degenerative practice, I think it's very challenging. Um, there's a significant learning curve to it, and it's really hard. There's no real data on the kind of the uh, outcome measures, meaning six months, one year, two year longer. There's some initial data, but very small numbers of uh, patients. What has definitely become the rage is 3D printing. Uh, titanium, uh, titanium printing used to be controlled by a monopoly, or it was a monopoly, I should say, one to two manufacturers of it, and now it's become very widespread, and the cost to print in, in titanium is actually very low. Uh, it's interesting because you can alter the the um, implant composition by changing the porosity, changing the architecture of the cage itself, and that in changes the mechanical properties such that you can have 3D printed titanium that actually has a modulus less than that of peak and even that of bone, and you can match it to osteoporotic bone. It potentially can optimize spinal fusions, and cer certain, um, I should say, one company in particular has the only claim to a nano lock feature, which is basically. Um, a macroscopic and microscopic uh, architecture of the titanium uh, with specific height so that it actually initiates uh, an, a osteogenic and angiogenic response. Essentially, because of the surface ar architecture at the nano level, it incites a cellular and a biocellular response, uh, theoretically increasing fusion. These are the claims that have been made. Unfortunately, like with everything else in Scott's parabola, we do see pseudoarthroses associated with titanium. Titanium is not the cure-all. I think that everyone is claiming it to be. And we do see non-unions that typically occur. And it still comes down to carpentry, kind of uh, my personal belief. But the fortunate thing is titanium implant pricing, 3D printing pricing has dropped down to the levels of peak. I know for our institution and for our surgery centers, there is no valuation that we place on titanium versus peak, and they're priced at similar price points. This leads us kind of to the next foray, which is uh, computer-assisted navigation. Several have been released in the, uh, the last several years. This is kind of a blurred line between navigation and exactly what robotics are doing. We're all very familiar with the O-Arm. There are different companies also that are using surface registration, whether that be 7D, and then I'll talk about some other augmented realities here in a second. But uh, navigation has had a, a long-standing role, uh, particularly in, in open deformity cases. Uh, for those who uh, subscribe to the belief of navigation, uh, they believe that uh, the, the inefficiencies are gained or, or lessened by the utilization of the technology over time, and then those inefficiencies decrease to the point that it's imperceptible versus open techniques. I'm not actually, don't, I don't necessarily espouse that belief, but I do think that there is a significant advantage. I have watched my spine tumor partner, who was relatively young, 
do some very slick pelvic surgeries with uh, navigation, uh, hemi sacrectomies, uh, sacrectomies with very fast cuts using navigation. Uh, those cuts that used to take us a long time kind of visualizing and planning, uh, now it makes them with ease and rapidity. So I do think there are advantages and I think that these, the workflow is increasing uh, or the efficiencies of workflow are increasing. Uh, robotics, we interestingly enough, as, as many institutions have several robots. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, the robot has not necessarily, I guess, lived up to the hype uh, in that sense. There are still some maybe user issues with it, some workflow issues with it. It definitely causes an increase in, um, in time. I think that there, the, the inefficiencies can be overcome, yet the cost is prohibitive. And as we transition to more outpatient surgery in the degenerative world, I should say, um, the value of the robot is still too expensive for it to be placed into typical surgical centers and only allows placement into mainstream hospitals. I do think that there are companies that are working on robots that will be disruptive to the market, in particular for those who are not familiar, but Google and uh, J and J Johnson and Johnson have partnered. Uh, they have a uh, a medical device arm that is coming up with a potential robot to be priced at about fifty thousand dollars per robot, which is much different than the half a million to one million is currently being charged. So I think that if the price point does come down, and a robot in essence is kind of glorified navigation for a large part, large part, but if it can become more cost efficient, you may see see, see some greater and widespread adoption just because of the, the, the reduction of um, fluoro and radiation, which we become more sensitive as time goes on. And these are some of the advantages and disadvantages. We're very obvious, and I think that every company now has a robotic platform. Whether that's utilized now or not, I think it's still kind of to be determined. Probably gain more mainstream uh, ado adoption in hip and knee replacement than it has in spine surgery. I think one of the big trends actually, uh, believe it or not, has been anesthetic protocol changes. So uh, this is just a publication that we put out uh, looking at perioperative management. So uh, looking at multimodal analgesia, there are now surgeons talking about awake anesthesia. I still struggle with awake anesthesia and its benefits, uh, but a strong multidisciplinary multimodal plan to address the inflammatory issues, the central nervous system issues, the local tissue blockade and destruction are very important. Now we routinely, or I routinely, routinely do cervical laminoplasty as an outpatient, anterior lumbar fusions as outpatient, one and two level lateral anterior posterior as outpatients. Essentially 80 to 85% of the practice that I have now is outpatient. And it's not because I'm a better surgeon anymore, but because I've become much more attuned to perioperative management. This has been the biggest transition that we are seeing in the United States currently. I think that um, as we see most commercial insurances and payers start advocating for a lower cost of, of the procedure, this bundle and transition to the outpatient is being forced. And if nothing else, coronavirus has accelerated that transition. Many of my colleagues have reached out asking about that transition because patients are fearful of going to the hospital anymore. And an outpatient environment kind of gives them mental relief and helps them transition kind of at least mentally to accepting surgery in the current state of affairs with the, with the whole COVID issue still in play. And this is just some of the other multimodal analgesia programs that we have uh, looked at. Virtual augmented reality, I think there are certain definitions that should be understood. Virtual reality is um, the real environmental impressions that are generated. So that's created to affect one or more of your senses. Augmented reality is actually taking what you physically see and then overlaying a virtually generated construct. Uh, and then a mixed is kind of both of those. So I think the biggest, uh, the biggest mover in this space lately has been in the, in the segment of augmented reality. So that is superimposing uh, images onto a surgical field. It initially started with Google Glass, and that was kind of quickly transitioned out. Um, a lot of these firms have been um, based out of Israel, and have uh, a lot of their uh, army and navigation and military style technologies that have been transitioned into more healthcare related fields. A uh, particular 
Augmetics has now come up and I've used it. I have no conflict of interest. Very interesting enough, um, they reduced the cost just to the headset itself, which is uh, approximately $15,000. And you have a fiducial reference mark, as you can see below. And then the preoperative CT scan is overlaid. I tried it out anecdotally. I placed uh, pedicle screws from L1 to S1 in a cadaver um, in about, I think it was a little over 90 seconds. It's amazingly fast. I think that it has a potential for disruption. And like I said before, I have no conflict of interest. And I can tell you, I'm not very good at placing pedicle screws uh, without uh, fluoroscopic guidance. So that was a huge testament to the technology as opposed to my own technical limitations. And these are some of the other um, images that are associated with it. And this is what I mean by augmented reality, the superimposed image. One of the key things that these companies have struggled with is changing the workflow of the, of the surgeon. Oftentimes when they talk about virtual reality, you're actually looking at a screen, much like the robot and navigation, and you're, it's non um, kind of ergonomically friendly uh, positioning. You're looking away from your surgical field, you're doing things opposite of the way you're trained. As we get better and better and more efficient and the technology becomes more sophisticated, the workflow naturally transitions. You're looking at the field, the image is superimposed. The surgeon is much more comfortable looking down at the particular environment as opposed to looking away. And I think these advancements are coming very rapidly as we've been seeing over the last year or two years in particular. So this leads to the last topic that I'll cover uh, very briefly. Um, Dr. Pimenta had the opportunity of seeing this technology approximately four years ago. And uh, I think he was still kind of a science experiment. I'm a co-founder of this technology, so I have a clear conflict of interest. He recently won the Spine Technology Award in 2019 basically ultrasound imaging, and before you roll your eyes, this is what it looks like currently in the state affairs. So on the left-hand side is a trans psoas approach. That's the psoas in gray, white, and black. I would challenge anyone in this room or audience to figure out what they're looking at. We took a software algorithm, ran ultrasound, and then we placed this superimposed image on it in real time. So now the surgeon sees a muscle, he sees a nerve, and he sees bone very clearly. And much like other kind of systems out there, there's a monitor that you look onto and it gives you real-time feedback. This is now 510K approved. FDA approved it approximately one month ago and it's commercially available. And I'll show you some cases of it in the operating room as, uh, on the next slide. The technique uh, as, as perfected by, uh, by Dr. Pimenta and, um, and other surgeons involves a non-trans psoas approach. So a dilator is placed over the top of the psoas. You see that schematically on the left-hand side. The dilator is locked into place and then a probe is positioned. The probe is positioned down. So this is placed superficial to the psoas itself. The psoas muscle is then divided into columns. We'll call them one, two, and three. Those columns are the anterior and the middle and the posterior column itself. So posterior is typically where we see the nerve root. The surgeon puts the probe down and in one second, a map is generated like you see on the right hand side. And you see these three columns generated and the surgeon is told that the anterior third and the middle third are clear and the posterior third has a nerve root in it. It's a real time image. This nerve root is both sensory and motor. So it has no, it can detect both as EMG independent. Then the surgeon places the dilators in position and has placed the pathway. So now the surgeon can do it with EMG monitoring or not. And then he knows to place it either into uh, the anterior, the middle, or the posterior third based upon the actual uh, scan itself. It's real time. It eliminates any puncturing of the psoas muscle, allows the psoas mus muscle to be punctured in one, in one single step without any traumatic uh, multiple passes minimizes that trans psoas hematoma that can occur, and particularly in, in early stage adopters of the technology. And it allows uh, for prevention of any skiving of the K wire itself, and it guarantees the path, and you don't have to be orthogonal. And it also images the blood vessel itself. This is a typical example or a case example of this. So we see in the anterior column, the middle column third, that these are nerve roots placed. This was actually the bifurcation and so oftentimes when you stimulate, you may get 
stimulation in one direction, but not the other, or you make it bilaterally, superiorly and inferiorly, or anteriorly and posteriorly, because you may not realize that you're actually physically inside the crotch of the bifurcation. Here's another example where this is a sensory nerve that was detected um, with the, the ultrasound imaging, but not detected with the EMG stimulation. I'll show you some videos. These are some of the publications that we have and presented. This is a real-time video. I hope it plays um, a surgeon using it. We're now 50 surgeries in on a commercially viable product. So here's a clear path with no nerve roots in place. He's moving an anterior and posterior. So he's saying, he's saying he can go into column two or column three, which would be the center of the disc space or posterior third and it'll be fine. Um, he was not comfortable because there was no nerve detected. So he wanted to direct the probe posteriorly and look for the nerve itself. So there he was stimming it and he found it in the two and the three position. He ultimately stimulated with the EMG and confirmed it. So we're about 45 cases in, in human clinical experience with no untoward outcomes. We match it with the EMG and it's now readily available. But the point of it being a uh, lateral approach is a very powerful approach. I think that there are certain tweaks that can be done to hopefully improve this in the outcome. Uh, overall, the technologies, uh, I, I go back to all of these technologies. Embracing new technology is part of our culture. It's part of who we are as surgeons. I always tell my fellows and my residents that are with me in the operating room that if I'm doing the same thing six months from now or one year from now, that means I haven't gotten better as a surgeon. If you look at other uh, professionals, whether they be basketball players, football players, athletes, race car drivers, everyone is looking to get better over time. I always feel like the onus is upon us as surgeons to always improve for the outcomes to improve and to improve the overall results for our patient. That means not just implants and industry sponsored devices. It means new techniques. It means a different approach to how we manage pre-op and post-operative pain, how we look at these people, not just from the surgical technique, but from the whole pain cascade. And I think it requires a paradigm shift in treatment. I always tell my residents and fellows, and my colleagues avoid the temptation of marketing, believe in tried and true orthopedic and neurosurgical principles, and ultimately good technology with good techniques will deliver the best outcome to our patients. Thank you. Dr. Karen, thank you for your presentation. Was, it was quite enriching. Uh, I would like to ask you to, to stay with us un, uh, until the end of, of the, the, the model because uh, we need to, 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 some, to, to do some questions in, in the finish of the, the Absolutely. Day. My Thank pleasure. You. Absolutely. Can I do a question? Can I make a question? Yes, yeah, please. Yeah, please. Karen, uh, uh, sounds to me that, you know, you present a lot of new technique and technology and sounds to me that probably the future will be combination of all this. Um, the, the, the people are looking at uh, these technologies as independent devices and sounds to me that the future will be probably the integration of all this, you know, navigated, robotic, uh, uh, ultrasound, uh, guided, uh, neuromonitor uh, uh, 3D printed spine fusion. So probably in terms of technology itself, looks to me that we are, uh, you know, uh, planting a seed right now and the integration of all the systems will be future. But you mentioned in the finish of, uh, about the finish of your presentation that, uh, you know, the, a tool with a fool is to a fool. So the, the most important uh, uh, game player in this, in this uh, uh, scenario is probably the, 
patient uh, uh, selection, relationship between medical uh, uh, physicians and, and patients, and probably the type of environment you are included in. So I want to just hear your opinion because I know you have a huge experience on on ambulatory surgery, and I know you, you have a, a floor in a hotel that people can just go there. <laughs> Uh, uh, you, you know, near <laughs> all integration between uh, physicians and, and recovering teams. So I just want to hear uh, from you. So, uh, yes. So, um, well, so it's a, that's a, it's a great question. And I think that ultimately there are two things that drive advancement. And one is clearly the patient and the patient outcome. And we'll assume that everything is for the patient. The secondary measure, particularly in the United States, and I think economic pressures are true all over the world, is that the reimbursement for surgeons is decreasing. And the one avenue to control that is to control what we call the bundle payment. So like you said, technology. Now, you know, when we price technology, at least how we price it in the outpatient arena, we don't price it per screw, per cage, per whatever. We price it for a one level fusion. And that means that company has to bring in its corresponding navigation, its corresponding disposable, its corresponding cages, and it has to be a seamless kind of integration. That also forces these forces company and industry to offer product specific or disease specific solutions, right? So they have to entire the whole the whole platform. No longer is it that oh I use one screw, one cage, one this. It has to kind of be the whole integrated step. It's interesting that you know, if you really look at industry, the margins have been very, very high on industry. So meaning that, for example, in the United States on a single level fusion, and as I negotiated in my surgery center, um, as I do a single level fusion in the surgery center, I get 40% less than the hospital payment. That's the first thing. But the implant costs don't change. And the implant costs end up being 70 to 80% of the total expenditure of that procedure. So when I do an MIS T lift, which I did today in the outpatient arena, I use iliac crest bone graft. I don't use anything else. And it actually works amazingly well through a small incision. I think that as surgeons become more vested in this, as technology is kind of um, has a cap on pricing, we have to be the ones that drive what we need as opposed to industry. So actually, I know I presented this a little while ago and Luis was at the, the meeting as well. I do a lot more lateral now than I did before. I do a lot more lateral because of the, uh, the ability to get it done efficiently and predictably, kind of lowers my cost, my operative time and my threshold. Uh, and, and it has certain advantages in kind of the overall grand scheme of kind of alignment issues that it's hard to overcome on an MIST lift. So that was something that I was kind of slower to adopt in the MIS platform. Um, I've looked at robotics and other techniques and technologies. I've struggled with it. For me, operating in two rooms in a surgery center, if I'm gonna do 10, 12, 14 cases, I can't get a robot in and out. I can't get navigation in and out. And that's gonna be the world that most of the surgeons in the United States are gonna be forced to. Unless you have a niche, lucrative practice, deformity and, and you can do that and the hospital can make money on. My hospital doesn't want those cases anymore because they're upside down, they're negative. So you can't be, and, I, and the last thing that we have is, I have a report card in every one of my partners and surgeons. And what do I record them on? I don't record them just on outcomes. I record them on the cost, on their cost to do surgery for a degen spondy. How much does it cost in the, the point of care? That means the day of surgery. How much does it cost for 90 days? And how much does it cost for one year? And I am now the policeman for this. I have to go to people and tell them, you're too expensive. And I have to tell them, you are no longer part of this bundle. And I think that's how we have to control everything. So I think we have to look and see how technology makes us better. And I don't think we can have iterative steps, meaning that we can have a small improvement. I think we have to have exponential generational improvement. Like I look at what's the biggest things that have changed me in my life, it's kind of crazy as it sounds, but a tube, which is basically like a toilet paper roll, B BMP, which changed us and kind of thinking about biologics, and lateral. Those are probably the three biggest things that have changed, you know, MIS, degenerative surgery in the last 10 to 15 years, which is about my career. 
Great, very great. Interesting talk. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dr. Kern. Uh, we need to move on. Uh, vou, vou assumir aqui agora. Então, dando sequência, é, Dr. Pimenta vai apresentar agora. É, o Rodrigo já fez a, as vezes aí de dizer, mas eu gostaria de reforçar quão importante para a gente é ser o Dr. Pimenta, porque muito do que a gente desenvolve aqui da cirurgia da coluna em cenário nacional se deve ao Dr. Pimenta, então é, é muito gratificante tê-lo conosco nos apoiando tanto na organização como como palestrante. Obrigado, Dr. Pimenta. Obrigado, Pratali. Uh, boa noite a todo mundo. Uh, tem uma pergunta aqui antes de começar a falar. Posso falar em inglês? Eu fico eu fico um pouco constrangido de deixar o Randy Alkin e o Kern fora dessa discussão, porque quando eu for falar isso em português, eu duvido que eles consigam acompanhar o que eu tenho para dizer. Ou talvez eu... Enfim, quero ouvir a opinião de vocês, Rodrigo e Pratali, enfim. Sobre a pre... o senhor apresentar em inglês? É, ou, ou claro. vocês acham melhor falar em português? Não, pode apresentar em inglês. É. Ok, então, eu, Hanjo e Kern Singh, é bom ver vocês ambos. Um grande honor de estar falando sobre... Tijan Scoliosis, I shouldn't talk about Scoliosis because I'm a neurosurgeon. Uh, my son is orthopedic surgeon and my best friends are all orthopedic. My office actually is full of orthopedic surgeons. Um, and I, I'm presenting here the future of treatment of Tijan Scoliosis when I basically am learning to treat Tijan Scoliosis. But I, because of what I do, what I have been doing, my life. Next, next slide. Uh, I, Gabriel, vai passando. Gabriel. Não tenho uh, So I'm consultant for Alpha Tech, that now is a new company. It's called APEC. And it's very different. Is the new Nuvasive? What was Nuvasive in the past now is ATAC. Next. Uh, it's interesting because when we start talking about uh, degenerative scoliosis, uh, the classification of degenerative scoliosis is based on adolescent scoliosis. So basically, the three main curves. And so it's all because of how. Degenerative scoliosis has been treated the last 50 years, uh, all posterior surgery. Uh, and I would be talking basically on changing this and how uh, we change and is it better or not. Uh, next. So basically, uh, the, the problem in degenerative scoliosis, that's a very complex uh, pathology. We have to try to identify where the pain comes from. Uh, and uh, recently, the last 10 years, the impact of uh, the global alignment has uh, changed a lot on our, our options uh, in treating the genus scoliosis. Uh, although I sh we should divide genus scoliosis, in my opinion, in basically two groups, one with another without cystoma alignment. But basically also the risk of the genus scoliosis treatment that may be bigger than uh, what the problem of the patient has. Next. Uh, when we look at the pathology of the genus scoliosis, they are all older patients with a lot of comorbidities. And when we look at what we are going to treat, are we treating the claudication uh, or are we treating the x-rays and we want to flatten and, and correct the, the, the a coronal alignment, uh, or we look more to sagittal alignment. Next. So uh, it's important also to understand, depending on the patient, if we will treat the global deformity or we will keep in focal problems. Next. Uh, 
talking about size alignments here in this group is uh, kind of a joke, but basically you, you see here uh, all the parameters that we we do, we, uh, we have SVA, pelvic instance, pelvic Q10, the, basically the mismatch of lumbar lordose and pelvic instance next. Uh, and also we learned that the compensatory mechanisms are very important. Sometimes we think it doesn't look like the patient has a, a malalignment until we, we look at the compensation mechanism, and which for me, it's a recent learning. So if I have to learn how the knee or the ankle uh, behaves, it's so far from my knowledge, but it's important in the global alignment, which bring us next. To, well, before the, the EOs, uh, it's important also to recognize the different curves, but basically having a low PI curve and a, and a high PI curve means that we have different parameters to correct. When we correct a, a low PI curve, we reduce the mismatch to less than 10, and a high P, PI requires more correction. So it's bringing the lordose slightly more than 10 in regard to the pelvic instance. Uh, very important also to recognize that for 5 and 5 1 is very, very important in the alignment, in, especially in the correction of the alignment, because we want to correct with a good harmony because harmony is key. In the past, the, most of the treatment was uh, PSO uh, L3, that the correction was great in regard to angles, but not very harmonic. Next. So, uh, age also, we learned more recently that when we have older patients, and by the way, all the SARS, the, the the scoliosis, they are older patients. When the patients are older, we, we don't apply exactly the amount of correction. We reduce the correction because they require less correction. Actually, if we apply all the correction, we are making more PJKs, and this is a, a, a difficult topic to discuss in front of all these panels here of big orthopedics. Uh, next. Uh, important and always for me uh, was difficult uh, the diagnosis of the gen scoliosis because the real title would be adult uh, adult uh, deformity uh, pathology that could be degenerative, could be iatrogenic. I learned basically by my mistakes in lateral is one thing that's very important uh, when we want to treat uh, uh, an adult uh, a deformed uh, iatrogenic uh, lateral, uh, the correction doesn't work. When we treat a degenerative works well, it, it's much more uh, related to uh, degeneration of the disc, instability of the levels, uh, rotation because of the instability. So it's a different, very different pathology. Next. Uh, so flexibility, by the way, is very important. So it's very important when we decide what to do to the patient to understand how much we want to correct versus how much the patient allows you to correct. Basically, how much morbidity the patient has. Uh, if we correct less, uh, we will not have good results. If we correct too much and the patient has a lot of comorbidity, the patient may die. So the idea, which is very, very diff difficult to understand, is to have the balance of the enough correction and the risk taken. Uh, and next. So, uh, and now we will start talking about the futures. Uh, it's not really the future. I think that minimal invasive surgery is not so, so new, but when we start treating uh, 
the gene scoliosis is minimal invasive. We thought that the correction was great, uh, but then the, all the studies show that, in essence, when we want to treat everything minimal invasive, we have a less risk but less correction. It depends, of course, how much correction we want to impose, uh, or how much correction the patient requires, the pathology requires. So the ideal situation right now, and this is fully related to technology, is having some sort of hybrid correction. We, we have some parts of surgery, they are less invasive, and other parts of surgery that requires open surgery. Next. So, how we treat uh, the mild and moderate uh, adult uh, deformed. So, we, when we do, and I, I start talking about the only posterior approach for deformities in general, uh, we learned with this experience that's, by the way, much, much bigger than the minimum invasive experience at the rate of complications they are very high uh, although when is needed is needed and you may argue that well when the patient survives they are great I, I, I don't like to be the patient in this anyway uh, but what the advantage of the minimum invasive surgery it's less blood loss, uh, less duration of surgery, reduced amount of fuse levels. Uh, is it proven that this happens? So th there are several studies showing that, yes, uh, uh, minimum invasive surgery may be coupled with some open uh, steps, uh, reduce the, the complications. Still are big number of complications. See, 24% of complications, not so low. Next. Uh, and, and when we continue in these studies, the correction uh, that we get with hybrid is better than MIS and uh, open is better than hybrid, which is important to understand. Uh, also, uh, this is another uh, comparison uh, of minimal invasive uh, in regard to size to alignment. In, in regard to size to alignment, I think minimal invasive is now in a good spot. We, we are able really to, to gain uh, alignment by uh, moving and cheer, coupling with posterior and cheer, gaining and cheer, and reducing posterior at the same time. That's the ideal uh, mechanism. The problem is that when we look to the options that we had in the past, are we talking about positioning the patient lateral, doing some laterals, and moving the patient uh, anterior to alias, and moving posterior to uh, Smith Peterson and posterior instrumentation? It's too much surgery, too much flipping the patient. So the, the new technique, this uh, that uh, the lateral procedure provided in regard to size to align correction was uh, called ACR, anterior column uh, correction, uh, realignment, uh, which is basically opening the ALL uh, and placing a, a hyperlordotic cage. But we learned that this is not really enough. So when you place a hyperlordotic, doesn't mean that we gain the lordotic that cage as a 30 degree lordotic cage would gain 15 degrees at that level. So we couple always anterior elongation with posterior shortening. That is the ideal correction. This is our one, one of the, the cases that we did in 3-4, look the, the ACR in 3-4 uh, and the nice correction that was um, Dynasis, a previous dynasis uh, surgery that resulted in a flat back. Next, another case uh, that was very malignant after a failed uh, posterolateral 
procedure. And in this case, uh, you can see that some levels are almost uh, hotic. And these levels are the ideal levels for correction. In L3-4, we were able to, to gain 30 degrees, uh, which made the correction much more interesting, although not perfect. Next. Uh, well, uh, it means that for now, we have a, a scenario that minimum invasive is interesting technology for the genetic oils, but because the procedure is so big, uh, to move the patient so many times, uh, the the chance to apply the lateral procedure, I I I know that Han Joe should look here me and say this guy is crazy. I I would have not move the patient three times to to do something that I can do from posterior uh, so much quicker in five six hours, right? Yeah, and Joe, well uh, you are wrong. Uh, and you know what I'm talking, I will talk a little bit about the new, real new uh, technique, because when we talk about advancements, it's very easy to talk about my new uh, watch or my new uh, technology uh, a machine, but talking about new techniques is harder. Uh, so uh, selection, uh, the recent selection of the patient is very important to understand the, how frail the patient is and also coupling the, the goal on alignment. These two technologies, the CAP score and the frailty uh, score, uh, although I don't see applied frequently, they, they should come as, a, as an implement for the, the result in this technique. Next. And at the end, uh, on technology, still on technology, the importance of understanding 3D, the EOS machine that gives you the 3D uh, deformity and the chance to correct better, including the legs. Next. Uh, talking about in, in this, uh, in this, uh, all this course, we, we already talk about artificial intelligence, and this may be a future. I can talk much about this. Uh, requires a lot of data. We don't have good data bank yet. Next. Uh, also, uh, the navigation and robotic, as was uh, talked by, by current seeing, is they are nice machines and the hospital wants to have them basically to show that they can treat more technologically the patients but the, the real goal and uh, importance of these techniques still didn't show up next what is really new in this uh, deformity surgery is the change of technique so when we change lateral technique to having the same technique through prone position, we are talking about doing at the same time the anterior elongation and the posterior shortening. And I can do the elongation, go posterior, do some Smith-Peterson, come anterior, correct position of my cage, and go posterior again, reposition and, and correct my my patient so when the patient stays in that frame there is a special bolster that can actually pre-op correct part of the deformity by coronal uh, movement and rotational movement this is the real future so you will have the patient in the table in the best position for your surgery going lateral and posterior at the same time. Uh, with this position, we have several advantages. One of the advantages, besides the advantage of being able to do the surgery, uh, anterior surgery and posterior surgery almost at the same time, uh, at least without uh, moving, changing the position of the patient, we 
by the position, we open, we gain so much more lordosis. And in depending on the flexibility of the patient, we actually know how much instability that level requires. And we were able to implant 20 degree cages without taking the ALL, which in my opinion, will reduce the ACR which is a big advantage because ACR technique still is a technique that has some complication uh, uh, percent. Uh, so the correction is better. So we, we know comparing the PTP, this technique is called PTP, posterior transoas, uh, level per level compared to x uh, The x is less than three degrees, and the PTP is more than six degree per level, is more than double the level per level correction without talking about opening ALL. Uh, another uh, advantage that the picture uh, was showing is that the plexus, because the psoas muscle is attached to the femoral head, when we extend the legs in that prone position, we bring the, the, the plexus posteriorly and clear 30% of the L4-5 level. So we will have much less plexus. We also have a much better um, uh, neural monitoring that includes SSCPs based on the femoral nerve. Uh, and this will actually give us the health of the L4-5 root. So that is really uh, a big advantage in this lateral procedure. Next. So uh, in conclusion, next, uh, we, uh, adult deformity is still a very broad topic, uh, difficult to cover in 15 minutes. Uh, but basically, we what we know now is that MIS helps, but is insufficient. Uh, when we change technologies uh, in M MIS technique, we may uh, be able to improve result and bring MIS closer to the uh, results in open procedure, reducing the comorbidity. That's all, thank you. Hi, uh, I had I had a problem with my internet, Dr. Pimenta. I I, I got offline, but now I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Luis, can I ask you one question? This is Kern. Yeah, go ahead, Kern. What do you think the biggest challenge and learning curve is on the prone lateral position and approach? Uh, I would say. Uh, and, and we have already 250 cases in between 15, 20 surgeries, uh, that it takes five surgeries. Uh, and the approach is basically the same, but it's like anything, right? You are used to do surgery from posterior. If you want to place medical screws with a patient in lateral, it requires a little bit of, uh, you know, you change your, your brain more than the technique. Here is the same. So it's the, when you position correctly the patient uh, and fix with these uh, posters, uh, the, all the, the peritoneum contents goes and tear and clears the retroperitoneal space. So uh, it is very safe. Um, there, there are some difficulties like gravity, for instance. So you position your first dilator and the gravity tends to bring your first dilator uh, down. So we, you have to learn how to, to deal with it. But there are some 
apps that require some training, but somebody that did lateral uh, would have maybe two or three cases, five cases to accommodate and be be facile in, in this technique. Karen, Karen uh, Rodrigo, uh, I'm also involved in the, the development of this PTP technique, and I would say that the learning curve for us surgeon that is used to do lateral surgery is very, very short. Probably, you know, three cases, two cases, five cases or so. The point is not just the, the learning curve for adopting the technique, is the type of uh, uh, retractor and instruments you require to do this in a, in a safe way. Because we evolve over time from a regular x lift done in a, in a prone position to a, a completely new a technique that we call, you know, the PTP will involve uh, a retractor, longer instruments, uh, fixation system, bolsters, coronal tilting. So it's not just exactly the learning curve itself, but it's very intuitive. It's a little bit more about uh, what is necessary to be to 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 do this in a safe uh, manner. Rodrigo, you work in a lazy labral position, right? After you put the tube in and dilate down. You kind of yeah. in a like we will rotate the table in a, like a 20 degrees of rotation so we keep in the direction of the eyes and it's very very comfortable standing uh it's complete completely change our, our workflow in the or it's beautiful you, you should try yeah no i was i was looking forward to actually before coronavirus that's what i was emailing about coming down and but uh, like many things coronavirus has changed coronavirus. our lives yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's move on. And uh, then, uh, Hanjo, are you are, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Uh, okay. Uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, Hanjo Kim, Dr. Kim is an orthopedic surgeon and also the director of the Spinal Fellow at HSS. Uh, Hanjo is a, is a very good friend of BSSG. Uh, he has, he's almost a honorary member. <laughs> and thanks very much again for help us. And it's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us, Hanjo. Thank you. Uh, you, you know, forgot to mention he's a runner too. <laughs> uh, not so good, Dr. Pimenta, not so good. Not as good as Dr. Pimenta, not as good as Dr. Pimenta. Um, so anyway, it's an honor to be here. And, you know, I didn't know exactly what the other speakers were going to talk about, but um, I'm actually very happy that I'm actually going to try to focus on perioperative management and, you know, Kern gave an outstanding talk on, on uh, all the technologies and Dr. Pimenta with all some innovative techniques, especially with some new procedures that could be applicable for adult spinal deformity. But I'm going to talk uh, today about uh, the perioperative management and where we could go with future directions with some of our uh, experience. Um, here are my disclosures. So when we think about future opportunities, I think we have to think about um, Think about the opportunities in, in, in a couple of different categories. Uh, two of the biggest categories, I think, are care delivery. And care delivery includes things like the preoperative screening for patients, intraoperative elements, such as surgical technique that we briefly touched upon, um, and postoperative management for these patients. And that is um, incredibly important because, like Kern was mentioning, uh, the value proposition for spine surgery has to improve in order for things to be sustainable. And ultimately, the payer will be more attracted to whatever provides more value. Uh, and then there's, of course, uh, for, for opportunities in the future is the, is the realm of data management, such as uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. But as much as I want to commend the, the, the multiple uh, colleagues that I have who have attempted to you know, write papers on AI and machine learning, if we really critically look at the literature for that, what we see is that 
The only thing they, they're doing that's a little bit different is, is terming, uh, putting the terminology of artificial intelligence or machine learning into their paper because what it comes down to is that they've essentially performed a very, very high level multivariate analysis to come up with, for example, risk factors for complications and things like this. And I think part of the shortcomings uh, for us to be unable at this time to do real artificial intelligence or machine learning is that we just do not have enough data points because companies like Google and Amazon, when they do artificial intelligence and, and, and they have these algorithms, they rely on hundreds of thousands of data points. And unfortunately, what we do in spine surgery and the databases that we have, at the moment, we don't have those uh, capabilities. But ultimately, what we want to try to do with these future opportunities is uh, decrease complications and optimize the outcomes for our patients. Now, I'm going to go into some details about what we could do and what the opportunities are on, on some of these sectors. So if we look at preoperative opportunities, things like screening the patients correctly, uh, optimizing them medically, also uh, bone quality assessment, and a lot of talk about bone quality uh, has been going on recently, and there are some very good um, medications that have come out in the last 10 years or so that uh, are able to help us with this, and there's some good data now that is coming out uh, on, on bone quality assessment uh, methods in addition to treatment for patients who have very poor bone quality, uh, because some of these things are related directly to perioperative complications like screw pullout, loosening, uh, as well as other types of hardware complications and junctional kyphosis. Uh, the other things uh, that many people may think about is the intraoperative opportunities for, for uh, uh, future innovation. And those, of course, uh, lie in the very literal sense with new techniques like tethering for pediatric deformities, uh, robotics, surgeon-assisted technologies like navigation or augmented reality. And then the other things that are important is optimization of the intraoperative team. And that's not really discussed very often, but I think a very important element in order to improve our value proposition. And then the post-operative management is not something as sexy that, that uh, we wanna talk about, but uh, nonetheless, it could be very important when we're thinking about uh, where we can go in the future to increase our value proposition. And that's with elements of pain management uh, mobilization for patients, as well as what happens to these patients after they get discharged from the hospital. So everybody knows this equation, but I want to bring it up because value is equal to quality uh, over cost. So if we're able to utilize some of these uh, innovative methods to improve the quality of our delivery um, while decreasing the costs with some of the uh, strategies that Kern was mentioning, which includes implants, uh, savings, uh, faster operative times, decreasing length of stay, all of these things will improve our, our value proposition, uh, which is uh, a very important thing to do as we, as we head into the future. So I really believe that care delivery goes hand in hand with value. So all these things that I mentioned on the left uh, they can, they have to play an integral part in improving the value in order for us to actually consider um, the technology or the innovation something that is worthwhile to invest in further. So, for example, Dr. Singh mentioned uh, some robotic technology, for example, that he may not use in the operating room because the operative times would uh, increase too much and he wouldn't be able to uh, get the cases done as quickly as he can otherwise. Also, the cost of a robotics platform might be very, very expensive. So in that situation, you're actually, your value equation is going negative because the quality is pretty much staying the same, but the cost is going up tremendously. And because of that, uh, the value will go down and, and that's not something that we would want to do. So every one of these elements have to be studied before they're widely implemented, but nonetheless, there's opportunities for all of these. Now, some of the value-based propositions that I've started at HSS uh, in the last maybe about four years, five years, has been a way to make spinal deformity surgery um, profitable in regards to increasing your value proposition. And some of the things that we try to tackle through the data is decreasing the length of stay, 
um, making sure that minimal number of patients is going are going to a discharge uh, to a discharge to a, a post-op uh, rehabilitation facility and instead they're going home lowering 90-day readmissions and also also lowering revision rates within that same time period now the other elements uh, that were important to uh, try to minimize were also obviously complication rates. And as you know, Dr. Pimenta uh, showed us multiple uh, 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 papers that have demonstrated high complication rates that have been associated with these operations. But um, I think uh, lowering them is, is one key element to improving the value proposition. And also um, having some reproducibility in an unrestricted fashion. So for example, um, if multiple patients come to the hospital, but you sort of cherry pick these patients, then all of a sudden the service that you're providing to the community is, is a very limited uh, number. And actually you're just really, in my opinion, you, you're in cherry picking cases uh, to decide who to operate on. You end up sort of uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul and don't end up really improving the value proposition in healthcare in general overall. And then, of course, the element of decreasing OR time, uh, implant costs, and 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 uh, and things like this. So, these are some of the papers that have been discussed in the past, uh, looking at uh, optimizing patients for lumbar fusion, improving lean processes, uh, utilizing um, um, uh, different methods um, for achieving that, such as the RAND criteria and other. Um, tr sort of uh, data processing methods. But um, I think <clears throat> some of the shortfalls of these papers is that, like I said before, th you end up doing a preoperative uh, screening process that, that, that ends up limiting care. And at the end of the day, doesn't always deliver the product to the people that need it most. Now, uh, despite all the studies that were, that I just demonstrated before, um, none of the studies have actually demonstrated an improvement in the value proposition. They have demonstrated a decrease in complication rates, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're improving the value proposition for these patients. And if we even look at something like length of stay, none of these papers really had statistically significant uh, decreases in length of stay. They did trend towards a decrease in length of stay. So 7.7 .7 to 7.5 days and 8.2 to 6.1. Um, and 6.8 to 6.3, but they have not had signif statistically significant differences with their interventions. So, so <clears throat> the other uh, element that the, none of these studies seem to take into consideration is the cost of implants. And I think this is something that we have to consider in the future. Uh, and it's a quick way to uh, improve the value proposition if we could find a way to decrease implant costs. So I'm gonna bring you back uh, about five years when we started to do a study here at HSS internally to look at this issue. And it started with a very simple idea. And this was a study that was performed uh, in 2017 and 18, but we started the data collection from 20, uh, 2013. And basically what we did is we looked at adult deformity patients and we said, okay, what is the cost comparison um, and also the outcome comparison between patients who undergo a lateral uh, and posterior combined surgery versus an all posterior operation. And because the numbers were probably around five, 600 cases, in order to have a very, very clean, clean study, we performed a propensity matched analysis to make sure the curve types and deformity types were matched correctly in addition to the patient demographics. And I wanna share with you some of this data because it brings us on a journey to where we are today. So. If we looked at surgical variables between the two groups, so you see here the first column is a lateral lumbar uh, inner body fusion with open posterior, and then the the group on the right is just all uh, all posterior surgery. So if we look at uh, uh, patient uh, surgical variables, you see that the all open posterior had slightly longer fusions, and their surgical time was significantly less. So instead of 405 minutes it was 286 minutes. So almost two hours in savings of operative time uh, with the all posterior approach. Next, if we look at implants, uh, the number of screws is slightly higher, uh, about almost two screws higher. 
uh, and uh, much more ubiquitous use of pelvic uh, implants uh, with iliac fixation. But uh, there, is, there is no inner body work that is utilized through the lateral or through the A-lift approach. And everything, if it, inner body work is done, was done through a posterior uh, T-lift approach. So, so what happens there, if we look at the differences also for, for implants is, is, the, is the topic of biologic, biologic. So yes, there's a little bit higher uh, BMP use in the all open posterior, but some of those differences are offset with a higher uh, use of bone substitutes, for example, in the lateral uh, group, in addition to a higher use of DVM, for example. And some of these DVM kits, for example, are more expensive actually than BMP, uh, depending on the packaging and the size. And you can see here almost a three times higher use of DBM uh, compared to an all open posterior uh, uh, utilized uh, operative uh, approach. So if we look at the cost estimation for all of this, and it, these are just estimates, but if you do a lateral procedure, the implant costs are about $30,000. If you do, uh, uh, that's combined with the posterior fixation. If you do an all posterior approach, the implant costs are about $18,000. So there's already about a $10,000 savings just with the all open posterior approach. And then the biologics use, yes, is about, uh, about $3,000 more for the all open posterior approach, but biologics are still used for the lateral as well as the open posterior cohorts. And if you combine what the total costs are, you could see that just by looking at implant use and biologics, the, all the lateral with a posterior approach for adult deformity is going to run you around $10,000 more. Or what I could say is about 30% more expensive than an uh, uh, open posterior approach. And that's also not to mention uh, this uh, uh, element at the very top. I bring your attention to the length of stay. The lateral lumbar inner body and open posterior group had an average length of stay of 9.3 days. The all open posterior had an average length of stay of 5.8. So now you're talking about a four day difference in length of stay, an implant cost that 30% more and patients who are being discharged to rehab significantly more as well, 50% more actually. So <clears throat> these are all um, areas of interest that I had in order to try to increase the value proposition uh, for the future of uh, spine surgery at HSS. So this is one approach to an all uh, a lateral inner body approach uh, uh, with a posterior fixation uh, where you use three lateral cages, two A-lifts, BMP goes in those cages and you use screws and you use rods. And then you have a case where there's no inner body use. Yes, there's a little bit more BMP use, but the, what you achieve is the same. You can see that this patient's x-ray is about uh, two years out. There's no uh, complications, no issues. You can see a solid fusion that has uh, formed uh, through that segment and you're able to achieve the same thing. Uh, and, and instead of achieving all of that fusion anteriorly, you could achieve it with a robust posterior fusion. So this is the uh, length of stay uh, uh, difference that I wanted to mention to you guys before, 9.3 to 5.8. And this is actually what interested me the most to lead to the next set of uh, studies that we started. So we wanted to see why, uh, what it was about length of stay uh, about, with patient factors that is going to allow for patients to actually have a shorter length of stay. And what we did is we did a poison regression analysis to determine what the expected length of stay was for patients uh, versus uh, what, what we thought was gonna be shorter versus longer. And, and the regression analysis helped us to determine that in a, in a cohort of 82 patients, single surgeon, single center, what you found is that the shorter length of stay uh, would be considered a 5.7 day value and longer is anybody over that value. And that was based on the statistics. So what we did at that time, and we just published this in the Global Spine Journal, is the, those who had a length of stay less than six days versus those greater than six days, we could just compare them, the clinical factors. And what you could see here is that the clinical factors between these two, pay, uh, two cohorts was very similar. So no real statistically significant differences here. And you could see that 
some of the things that we compared were uh, all the patient demographics, but also perioperative narcotic use, the timing of surgery, because our interest here was not so much the surgeon factors, but it was what factors related to things that the hospital could modify uh, are related to a shorter length of stay. Uh, one thing that we did notice is that the blood loss was less. So if you had a, a, a greater length of stay than six days, you, you had about 400 cc's more blood loss for an operation. Um, the other thing is that when you looked at the procedure length of time, the, 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 the longer length of stay patients had about one hour longer surgeries. Five, these are all open posterior patients um, and about 5.5 days versus those who stayed less than six days uh, had an average length of surgery of 4.8 and that's total operative time. Um, and then also we looked at things like procedure end time. So we saw that patients who were gonna leave er, uh, earlier usually were out of the operating room and in the recovery room by three, uh, before 3 p.m. or in the morning. Uh, if they came out after 3 p.m., so if they were like the second case of the day uh, or things like that, they were less likely to leave uh, uh, quickly. The other thing that we noticed was that the ICU stay was uh, significantly different for these patients, and that sort of makes sense. And also the ICU costs are very something that we have to consider as well. And bringing that uh, number down was something that was of interest. Next, if we looked at neurologic complications and medical complications between the two cohorts, what we found is that the post-op neurologic issues were similar between the two cohorts, but the medical complications was very different. So the people who stayed longer were ones who had medical complications. And, and these are patients that I will not say, they weren't very serious medical complications, but they were things like ileus or um, a DVT or, or had renal failure or something like that. And, and these are things that resolved, but it just took a few days and therefore increased their length of stay. So basically what this taught us is that what can we try to modify to decrease length of stay and increase the value proposition for uh, adult deformity surgery? And what we came out with based on that publication was operative time, decreasing your uh, blood loss, and postoperatively minimizing the ICU time and mobilizing the patients very quickly. And the reason why we want to mobilize the patients, we realized that of the 15% of medical complications that happened, 50% of them were because of an ileus, because they were getting too much narcotic medication. And because the patients were having abdominal pain, what happens is they have to hold the pain medication. So patients have poorly pain, uh, poor pain control, then they can't be mobilized enough to meet criteria to meet discharge. So we were really trying to mobilize these patients quickly to try to minimize the incidence of, uh, of things like that from happening. So this brings you to today uh, of what we uh, just did, which was we wanted to de determine if we made a tailored inpatient clinical care pathway to incorporate all of these key elements, can we really decrease the length of stay and in increase the value proposition for these patients? And basically we focused on all the factors that I mentioned from the prior publication in the Global Spine Journal. EBL, OR time, early mobilization. And when I say early mobilization, my T10 to pelvis patients will get up on the day of surgery and walk with physical therapy. That is the order and that, that is the way that we are uh, trying to uh, enhance the recovery for these patients. And we try to avoid ICU stays uh, if possible. Now, some of these things uh, can be done um, in anybody's tailored fashion, but some of the things that we did is a dedicated anesthesia team for decreasing blood loss, um, sort of having a controlled routine on hypotension for the approach, um, maybe the utilization of uh, transient paralytics like vecuronium in order to make the approach faster and easier uh, and less blood loss. Um, transition the ICU stays to overnight PACU stays instead, if necessary. And then a hospital is that's gonna be uh, following these patients uh, that is dedicated to the spine deformity service. Then uh, decreasing the OR time included things like uh, making sure that um, we had a dedicated uh, surgical tech for every case. I separate the surgeries into four stages uh, and I usually dedicate one hour to each stage. First hour is exposure. Uh, second hour is instrumentation and uh, inner body work. Third, uh, third hour is osteotomy work and reduction. 
Um, and then the last hour is bone grafting and closure. So trying to stick to these guidelines and the room, everybody in the room, including the circulating nurse, knowing that these guidelines are what they have to shoot for and think about, everybody stays ahead of, of, the, of the timing to, to decrease the operative time and to ultimately do more cases and increase the value proposition for the operation. And then the early mobilization. So some of the ways that we've decreased this ileus risk was um, deep minimizing the narcotic use, utilizing Decadron on post-op day two and having a standing order of Toradol if the patient can tolerate it based on the kidney function and age. Early diets and early mobilization and also mobilizing patients instead of just twice a day, mobilizing patients three times a day. So uh, we did a power analysis looking at the initial data. And what we found is that uh, we needed 26 patients. But once we got to 20, I was very curious to see what the data looked like. So we did a, um, a preliminary analysis on, on the first 20 patients that we enrolled in this pathway in a prospective way. And we compared them to a historical cohort of 20 patients. And we made sure that they were well matched by propensity matching them based on all their patient demographics the use of three column osteotomies, as well as the number of levels of fusion. So, um, you know, these are some of the details that I spoke about. If you have questions, of course, I could send you guys uh, exactly what I'm doing. But one of the things that I, that I also have changed is my um, method for uh, preparing the pedicle tract. So I utilize now a flexible drill bit instead of the lanky probe for the uh, preparation of the pedicle. And every single screw now will take me about 20, five to 30 seconds to place. Um, I'm not saying just put the screw in 25, 30 seconds. I'm saying from the point I find my starting point, I cannulate the pedicle and I place my screw. We're talking about 25 to 30 seconds. And then here is uh, some of the post-operative management that I mentioned, and I'm happy to share that with the group as well. So uh, this is some of our data. What we saw is that when we match these patients by propensity matching, they were very well matched by the demographics. So you look on the p-values, there's nothing significant, very well matched groups in regards to comorbidities and the uh, uh, deformity type and the revision surgery, the number of levels of fusion. Um, but what we found here is that when we utilize this pathway, we now brought the average blood loss down to less than one liter. Uh, so about 500 cc's of savings. We decreased the ICU state to 0%. We also then um, decreased our operative time from an average of five hours to 4.3 hours. Um, and then uh, we uh, mobilized these patients uh, early on. And what we see is that 85% of them were already uh, well into walking uh, by the first day after surgery instead of patients just standing up. And with all of these factors uh, included together, what we found is that the average length of stay for these patients decreased from 7.3 days to 4.5 days. So very significant difference here, almost three days difference in length of stay, and obviously a step in the right direction of being able to improve the value proposition for these operations. Well, you may say, well, if you're kicking these patients out of the hospital sooner, maybe they're having uh, uh, more readmissions later on. And we tried to look at that. And what we found is that both cohorts, 90-day complications, uh, and readmissions, there were, there were no readmissions in either cohort. There were similar complications within the first 90 days between the two groups, uh, medical as well as surgical. And this decrease in medical complications is really the decrease of ileus that happened with this new pain protocol. And the, most of the surgical complications here in the expedited cohort are dural tears that did not end up increasing the length of stay because we were able to repair them watertight and we did not keep them down post-operatively if we had a good seal. Uh, next, uh, some of the things that we uh, talk about about the pain protocol here, many, 25% uh, of them, we try to get them off the PCA very early. Um, and then um, on post-op day one, uh, post-op day one, 25% are, are off. Um, as opposed to before, uh, zero patients had it off on post-op day one. And, and we used to take them all off uh, on post-op day two instead. So we're decreasing the narcotic load, adding on steroids and other methods for perioperative pain management. So basically this clinical pathway led to about a 38% reduction in the average length of stay after a single length of uh, single stage 
posterior knee approach for adult spinal deformity. And I think we're gonna make some progress here in the value proposition because we were able to demonstrate a decrease in length of stay by almost 40%. Uh, we basically minimized uh, re post-op rehab discharges from 25% to 5%. We had zero 90-day readmissions and revisions within the first 90 days. We had decreased our blood loss from 1,400 to 900 cc's. Decreased the length of surgery, which also saves on operative time and the cost of operative time. And we decreased the ICU stay to zero, which also decreases the cost. Of, uh, of the patient's length of stay. So if we were to extrapolate this and use Medicare data, which is just generalized data, um, what you see is that the median hospital cost for this type of surgery is about $34,000 uh, per patient. Um, but an average inpatient day length of stay is around 2,400, 2,500. So we're talking about a, a significant improvement just with three day length of stay reduction of 20%. And that's not including the 30% of savings of implant costs that I demonstrated in the study before that was done two years ago. So uh, basically uh, I think the future directions of spinal deformity surgery are gonna rely on uh, optimizing our out outcomes, minimizing our complications and ensuring that we could uh, increase the value proposition by utilizing uh, those two strategies. And um, I think as bigger companies start to get involved with uh, healthcare, like, like Amazon, for example, um, uh, I think that uh, we're, we're gonna be, have better um, AI algorithms that will allow us to do this uh, more easily um, without having to do uh, what, we consider now, what we consider now to be good statistics, but uh, down the line, when you have hundreds of thousands of data points, uh, this may seem uh, very elementary. Thank you. Very nice, Andrew. Uh, you presented some of those data in the that meeting uh, HSS, you, you did in H, the guys in HSS two weeks ago, right? I, I saw it. Uh, was, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. That's when, it's because uh, it's yeah. when we, uh, I think it was when I was giving grand rounds at uh, at NYU. Uh, no, very, very interesting and outstanding outcomes. Very nice. Uh, any questions? Uh, I, I have a, I have a, a question. Uh, actually, it's more a philosophical question, um, and I extend for all the panelists who, who want to 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 take their opinion. Uh, if we see the history, the past, and um, what scenario uh, do you guys suppose the technology will take us in the future? Uh, we would make our surgery faster and safer, uh, and we will have more time to go home, stay in family, drink wine, uh, write our papers, or because we have more uh, technolo technology available, we will raise our targets as was made in the last 100 years, and you try every time more complex surgeries, more complex surgeries, and we will still uh, do the, the same the same way we are doing now. Do you understand my my point? What what, yes. what scenario you 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 realize? Well, I think um, that's a very philosophical question, uh, <laughs> but I think history history says that uh, by nature the paradox of, of progress is exactly what you said. Um, despite us a being able to do more um, in a shorter amount of time, doesn't mean that we're gonna do less. We're actually gonna do more. Um, yeah. you know, if you think about, for example, accountants, right? Uh, accountants, if you ask them uh, 35 years ago, 40 years ago, how long did it take to do the accounting for uh, taxes? And they said it would take them days because they would have huge spreadsheets, multiple data points, multiple numbers everywhere. But now they have programs, they have Excel spreadsheets. You could just put number in a formula and you could just find, organize it, right? 
And, and that means the accountant, well, you could say, well, say the accountant, well, now that this program came out, um, you, you have about 50 clients a year. So will you just keep the 50 clients, but you're going to have so much free time now because you got the program. No, the accountant is going to take on 300 clients, right? And <laughs> keep on working harder and, 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 and trying to uh, make more money or, or be more busy and have a better uh, uh, client practice. So I think the problem is that it's in our nature to try to continue to push and, and to strive uh, for excellence. And I don't think that's necessarily bad, um, but I think we do have to find some balance. Yeah. So my take is, this is current, my take is a little bit different on technology. And, you know, Hanjo study is interesting. It has the common failures of, and this is kind of, you know, the, what we write, which is that, you know, technology to me is an enabler of standardization. And so what you're really looking at is the future is actually a, a homogenous surgical experience. Because what we really don't very, you know, do much in granularity or distill out is bad surgeons and very good surgeons. And technology tries to level that playing field. So robotics, uh, navigation, it takes an average or below average surgeon and allows them to do a procedure that, you know, Hanjo can do in two and a half hours. That now they can accomplish it in seven hours where they couldn't you know, perform that procedure before. So to me, technology is trying to enable surgeons to get to a more level playing field. If you look at all the studies that we do, now, and this goes to new technology and adoption. When lateral is being done, and Dr. Pimenta is perfecting lateral and doing lateral. He's a skilled surgeon with skilled associates, and he's navigating that kind of complexity. But for him to take lateral mainstream, he has to standardize the process. Even with the standardization of that process, there is still heterogeneity in surgeons who perform the procedure to this day. That allows for innovation. That is the same thing now with the next iteration, which be prone lateral, whatever it may be. I look at technologies as a way of making surgeons more equal. If I went down and I actually distilled that Hanjo's data, and I do agree that there's too, too much BS about using AI and data analysis. It's just a way to get invited to lectures and get your, your presentation accepted for a podium. I should just do that for everything I do now, which is like, you know, AI something. But it doesn't really mean anything. What you actually want to look at is, and, I, and, and, and so there's so many problems with cost and variables. Like, you know, you could negotiate out implant costs on lateral inner bodies and drop the cost down. I could give you cost savings. It doesn't improve your surgical outcome. I could change your, your hospitalization by improving your preoperative protocol by putting you on a bowel prep beforehand. I could save that money. Those are very incremental changes that come up with large scale financial results. But what Hanjo is not hitting upon is there's variability in good and bad surgeons at his institute. And that's the same thing at our institute and every other institute. And I said it earlier, I actually have a physical report card on surgeons. And the future is, it's not the technology. The future is in 10 years, can you be a highly efficient, low cost surgeon that delivers high quality of care? And can technology complement you to deliver that? And so we are, we are already in bundles. New York is kind of an isolated environment. They get paid a lot of money for surgeries that the rest of the country doesn't see. We have to get to surgeries that are cost efficient. I've been forced to use Iliac Crest. I could never do Hanjo's surgery in my institution without them coming out at me. Now, if I could get it to a point that is cost efficient and it's a bundle that makes sense, absolutely. And every technology as we see it, when we first started putting pedicle screws into place, we couldn't put pedicle screws. It'd take an hour. You do a little laminotomy. You look for the pedicle wall. You put it in. Then we became really good. And now guys can put it in like Hanju in their sleep. And they say, well, why do I need a robot? Why do I need a navigation? And I say the same thing. But you have to take a look back. Technology makes the surgeon that couldn't do it, that's still trying to do it, that's still doing it, better enough to improve that outcome. So you're raising the floor with technology. Hanjo, Luis, Rodrigo, all you guys are going to do slick surgeries. But the question is, can we raise the floor and create a homogenous playing field? And I believe that's what technology advancements do. Well, yeah, so uh, let me comment a little bit on what you just said is when we develop lateral surgery, 
the idea was not to develop a, a special surgery for some good surgeons, and I'm tired to hear that only pimenta can do it. Uh, actually, the the goal of lateral procedure, and we divided in 20 some steps, was that once the surgeon learns, uh, a regular surgeon learns the step, the regular surgeon will do a good surgery. May take a little more time, will have a little bit more complications, but the result of the best uh, improvement of technology. And in technology, I'm not only saying about machines. Technology involves techniques. Uh, and, you know, and by the way, uh, when we talk about the cost of implants, what about having an implant that doesn't require a graft? Then we have an implant that you stay there, place the implant, and the the bone will grow through the implant and we will not need uh, a graft that's the in my vision the next thing that will happen with the titanium portals uh, anyway i mean there's some a talk thoughts. that i give dr Pimentel, there's a talk that i give and it's about everything i learned about spine surgery i learned from my joint surgery partners and, I'm, and the reason is because you said exactly what I believe in. I believe 100%. I believe in Henry Ford and automation and standardization. I don't believe, I believe 90% of spine surgery should be and can be standardized. If you come into an operating room, whether it be in Chicago or New York or Brazil, and watch a total hip and total knee, it's done almost exactly the same way for different pathology. And should, and should. Yes. Yeah. And if you walk into an operating room, if I do lateral, you do lateral, MIS, whatever, it could be the same institution across the hallway, across the city. It's completely done differently. And, and I think that degenerative cases allow for easier standardization. And that's why you get some homogeneity, but you still have variation. And deformity is that last spectrum, which there's so much. But I think that the, the, the attempt at new technology and data collection is to start telling surgeons, like you're saying, Hanjo was saying, which was predictably this surgery should not be done by you, number one. Number two, it should be done in a co-surgeon fashion. Three, it should be done in the following steps. I mean, that's really the next step. And I think payers in the United States are really looking at that data and saying, oh my God, I can tell you our institution is having conversations with not recredentialing certain surgeons because of their cost and complication rates. Wow, that's a hard conversation. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's like, okay, Hanjo, I'll give you the scenario. You're jumping on an airplane and I'm like, you know what? I have a 30% crash rate. You want to go see, uh, you want to go to Vienna? Where are you going? <laughs> I'll go fly Sing Air. <laughs> you don't want to fly Sing Air. <laughs> yeah, you better get off the first exit. <laughs> uh, very, very interesting thought, you know, reducing the, the art on our uh, uh, daily basis is something very, very interesting. And I think technology can probably handle that. Uh, in the history, if you take a look, the art itself uh, was considered something different over time. So in the past, you know, building a house could be considered art. And over time, you know, building a house is just something necessary. But there's that, you know, making a, a, a house building something much more pre, uh, precise and reliable doesn't take the scenario of the art of the construction itself. So it's something that we have to consider that probably 99% of the surgeries can be done in a regular basis, standardize it, but, you know, will always be some spacing for, for art and for some inventions and, and innovations. Interesting. Okay, guys. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Hanjo, uh, Karen, Dr. Pimenta, Davi. Thank you for all uh, participants. Uh, thank you for the guys, our, my, our partners uh, from the Brazilian Spine Study Group to organize this course was very, I'm very happy with uh, which we we did, uh, but we did with uh, participation of all. 
and Rodrigo, do you want to 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 finish to end the? Yes, uh, I'm just going to change for Portuguese for a while, and then I'll come back for for English. Uh, eu gostaria de agradecer a todos os participantes, em especial dizer que o Brasil na Hispanista de Grupo é muito grato pela participação de todos e anunciar que nessa sequência de, 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 de lives, né, de, de reuniões é, semanais, a gente resolveu é, tentar trazer um tópico que possa ser de interesse dos, dos participantes, que é o cenário econômico, né, já que a gente sofreu é, um impacto econômico bastante significativo, a gente resolveu trazer um especialista em, em, em economia, um especialista em mercado financeiro, para trazer um pouquinho do que ele espera que seja as perspectivas do mercado econômico e financeiro do Brasil após o período de pandemia. Então, na semana que vem, para todos aqueles que estiverem interessados, a gente tem uma live que não vai ser feita no mesmo modelo que nós fizemos essa primeira, a gente tentou variar um pouquinho, até porque o público acredito que seja diferente, mas a gente vai estar tá falando um pouquinho de perspectivas financeiras e de como uh, tentar enfrentar esse cenário financeiro pós-crise. Pós a gente vai tra trazer o, um palestrante chamado André Perfeito, para alguns de vocês que acompanham, cenário de, de bolsa de investimentos, valores e, e ações. Esse é um cara bastante conhecido no Brasil. Ele é um economista-chefe da Necton, corretora de valores, e ele vai estar tá falando com a gente na semana que vem, dando algumas dicas para todos aqueles que tiverem interesse é, nesse assunto ou, eventualmente, quiserem indicar para algum médico ou alguém que tenha interesse nesse assunto. Então, é mais realmente dar um alerta para todos, agradecer a presença de todo o público e para quem tiver ainda gás, né, às 10 e meia da noite da quarta-feira para continuar essa discussão, eu acho que a discussão estava caminhando num caminho muito bom. Se alguém tiver interesse em mais perguntas, isso tudo, a gente pode é, dar sequência nesse papo. Ô, Rodrigo, posso fazer uma pergunta para o Davi aí? Deve. <risos> Davi, boa noite aí, parabéns aí primeiro pela aula e né, mais uma vez obrigado aí por ter aceito o convite aí do grupo. Eu, eu, eu queria te fazer uma pergunta assim, a gente é, tem visto aí um, uma onda crescente aí nessas dissectomias percutâneas aí, sabe? E pelo menos aqui na, na região que eu, que, eu, que eu moro, assim, eu tenho visto um número bem grande assim de procedimentos. É, do teu ponto de vista, assim, qual que é a tua opinião sobre a disectomia percutânea? O que que o, o que que você acha que que ela faz de igual ou diferente? Porque às vezes eu vejo assim que alguns residentes, os fellows nossos perguntam sobre a questão da disectomia percutânea, que tá até mesmo tendo um pouco de confusão em relação àquilo que é que é a disectomia endoscópica, que a gente sabe que é totalmente diferente, né? Os conceitos. Você poderia explicar explicar um pouquinho assim no teu no, no conceito da tua é, da tua opinião real assim sobre disectomia percutânea ou não assim é, toda a cirurgia endoscópica foi endoscópica aquilo que foi o tema da, da minha aula é uma cirurgia percutânea mas nem toda a cirurgia percutânea é uma cirurgia endoscópica não sei se você está falando da cirurgia me, da disectomia mecânica né da isso esses decompresso né esses... Olha, eu não faço, tá? então eu não, te, não posso te falar por minha experiência pessoal. Mas assim, a indicação da disectomia percutânea é bem restrita. Você não pode, você não consegue lidar com uma, pacientes que têm algum grau de estenose, pacientes que têm algum grau de é, de alguma extrusão, entendeu? Porque ela não consegue absorver, não consegue puxar a extrusão. Né? Então, talvez para alguma protrusão pequena. Alguns estudos já demonstraram que ela tem uma certa eficácia, né? Mas o, 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 a indicação fica bem restrita, né? São protrusões, né? Você não pode... São pacientes que preser, preservaram no fibroso. Então, você fica um pouco de mãos atadas, né? Eu não me sinto confortável. Eu, preciso, eu, eu prefiro enxergar aquilo que eu estou abordando. Eu prefiro enxergar o nervo. Eu prefiro enxergar o ano fibroso. Eu fazendo uma anotomia e tirando aquilo que está por baixo do de, daquele ano, né? Aquele nervo, que aquele aquele pedaço de disco que eventualmente é, protruiu, mas 
É complicado, é difícil falar, tá? É difícil falar da, da sexicomia percutânea. Eu, eu não tenho experiência. Eu, pessoalmente, não tenho experiência. Então, assim, não muda muita coisa, né? Uma um paciente que tem indicação para disectomia percutânea, ele tem uma boa indicação para uma disectomia transforminal simples, entendeu? Então, você vai lá, entra com o forame, entra com a ótica, você vai enxergar no monitor o teu espaço epidural, você vai enxergar o ânulo e você vai direto no ponto que você quer acessar, né? Então, um, um, a complexidade do procedimento não muda muita coisa você tem mais certeza. Mas você vai manter a tua restrição de indicação. Aquilo que eu falei na minha aula sobre a indicação da transforminal. E esse foi o problema da transforaminal, na verdade. Por que, que a endoscopia, assim, se ela é realizada a endoscopia de colon desde os anos 70, por que ela demorou tanto tempo para começar a pegar mesmo na comunidade? Pô, nos anos, só nos anos 2000, 2010 começou a pegar? Por que, que demorou? Não, posso, posso estender essa, essa, esse seu comentário e essa sua, esse seu raciocínio para o Kern? Por favor. O, o, o Kern. We, we, Kern. Kern. We, we're talking about endoscopy and decompressions. And, you know, David is, is a, a, great, a great specialist and he, he's probably the best uh, uh, guiding with endoscopy in, in uh, Brazil for sure and maybe Latin America. Uh, and the question here is why uh, endoscopy doesn't go, you know, they, they are around since the 70s and why the endoscopy uh, endoscopic uh, spinal decompression didn't take a place a big place in the spinal uh, uh, scenario since you know 2015 or 12 or so so why uh, what changed in spinal uh, decompression endoscopy uh, in recent times that make this uh, option now different from from uh, past days So, you know, I did uh, endoscopy 10 or 12 years ago, and then I kind of got frustrated with it, and then I played around with it uh, two or three years ago. Um, I'll talk about my challenge and the, the challenge in the United States itself. You know, the first challenge of the United States is you're paid exactly the same if you do an open discectomy, a tubular discectomy, and the endoscopic discectomy. So there's no financial uh, incentive, so to speak. Um, that way. And I think financial incentives drive a large part of procedures. I give the best example. I very rarely do posterior cervical fusions and often do laminoplasty, which is paid less. In the United States, it just doesn't get done much, laminoplasty, because you are paid so much less. So per time spent for endoscopy, um, it is less reimbursing. That's one of the biggest challenges in the United States for, um, for adoption. And then um, some of the efficiencies of scale So uh, I think that endoscopic surgeons and I think endoscopy works really well. I just have a hard time seeing the exponential or the, um, the advanced improvement in the outcomes relative to a tubular discectomy and a tubular approach. And then there's a decrease in the efficiency. So for example, in any one day in our surgery center, for me, I may do 12 to 18 discectomies in a day. And I go back and forth in two rooms. So if I'm going to do 12 or if I'm going to do the most we've done in one day, I've done 26 cases in a day. If I'm going to go back and forth, there's no endoscopy way that I can do it in a fast enough fashion. So to me, it's just the inefficiencies of it without any reimbursement and with nominal improvements. Now, you could talk to me about endoscopic approaches where they make sense, like far lateral disc herniations, particularly L5, S1, they're more challenging. Um, for animal stenosis revision cases without, with some partial instability, you're trying to avoid that. I can, see advan I can see advantages, and I can potentially see advantages in fusion cases, but it's been, they're very poor radiographic images and some challenges with that and so on. So I, I think the financial reimbursement, I think the, the lack of the efficiencies that can be gleaned in a high volume practice if we kind of move to that, that's been barriers to adoption, at least in this country. Davi? Uh, I was talking in English. In English uh, what I had seen, then I came from uh, my, my first training was in uh, South Korea, in Seoul, and uh, where do hospital. And they, in the time I was there, they used to perform 30 
vasectomies in two operating rooms in a whole day. Like it's a turning over. Like they perform a, a surgery, a discectomy, and maybe it takes 20 to 30 minutes. Germany groups, they perform discectomies in eight minutes. I've, I, I've seen with my eyes that Rutten performs a, a discectomy with no hurries in eight minutes. He removes that and he performs a great decompression in eight minutes. So with endoscopy, you, you, your turnover with, with patients is, is much better. It's, it's, it, 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 it works. Like if your, your aim is to uh, improve your performance in a operating room, yes, the better, to, if you have the, the, the tools to perform the, the endoscopic surgery, you, you may perform lots of surgery, but that's not the point. I, I was discussing with, uh, with uh, uh, our colleague here, that with Dr. Ricardo Casio, is that the, when we shift the, this change to the interlaminar approach, change the results, change the outcomes with the, the endoscopic surgery. When most of sur surgeons used to perform it with, through the, the transformational approach, they had lots of complications, lots of cases that uh, they, 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 there were still fragments of these in the in the patient with uh, high rates of recurrence or maybe bad results because of uh, not enough decompression of lateral recessive stenosis or foraminal stenosis. So with the interlaminar approach, you solve these kind of problems. So the, your, your, your outcomes, the, the outcomes of endoscopic surgery improved a lot with the interlaminar, with this shift to the interlaminar approach, instead of making all the, 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 the approach with the transformer, it changed a lot. So, um, and we have in Brazil, many surgeons, they are making this movement to the interlaminar approach to perform complex case of disc herniation of the degenerative lumbar disease and of uh, lateral recessive stenosis. And all of them are having great results, as well as great groups in Germany, as well as in great groups in South Korea. So and maybe that's the answer to Ricardo Acasio, our colleague. Yeah, I would be foolish, I guess my rebuttal would be, I would be foolish to say it's not an invaluable technique. I still perform endoscopic approaches, but I just do, I do them selectively. You know, the challenge, like I said, in the United States is, I go back to the reimbursement drives everything in the world. That's number one. I mean, I just think that's just finances. If you want to watch history, history is always about money. It's nothing about anything else, but history is about money. And if you look at the surgeon adoption in the United States, that holds true. So the problem that we have in the United States in particular is you are paid X amount of money for a microscopic decompression, $5,000. If I put a tube in and I use the tube, there's no disposable. Disposable costs in endoscopic surgery become cost prohibitive. So, and right now, most endoscopic companies are not willing to commoditize or decrease the cost of the disposables associated with it. So then you take a procedure that is $5,000, it's decreased by the cost of labor, cost of operative time, cost of anesthesia, and then add the cost of disposable, and it really becomes cost prohibitive that way. And so, you know, if, if it was reimbursed and it was reimbursed at a level that would be better than what we have conventionally, which I can't see the payers doing because it's hard to justify on the clinical outcomes, then, then you would see more adoption. But right now, the guys who typically do surgery endoscopically here in this country have small practices that are niche practices that are cash paying practices. So people pay out of pocket. That's why it doesn't, that's the unique experience of the United States. And I can't apply that to Germany and South Korea where they're experts and like you in Brazil, they're experts. But finances determine a lot of the surgical adoption, particularly in this country. So, Karen, basically now bankrupt, right? Later Spine Institute is bankrupt. Exactly. Basic, basically, in USA scenario, you have uh, same efficiency and more cost. And I, I think you could, I think, you know, I think what David said is accurate. With high volume surgeons, you can get to a point of efficiencies of scale and you can get to improvement. I would never question that. 
What I'm saying though is in a limited surgery center, so I do 80% or 90% of my cases in the surgery center. That means not just logistically different, but I have a small sterilizer. I can't turn over large towers and equipments very quickly. Mm -hmm. I can't pay for the cost of that. And that's the trend in the United States. So independent of endoscopy, physician owned surgery centers are the trend. Everyone wants it. Everyone wants to be a part of it. And if you are a surgeon that is increasing the cost and decreasing the reimbursement to your partners, they're going to get very upset with you. And yeah, exactly. They cut you out. They kick you out of the surgery center. So that's why the adoption is by very, very select groups of people who have established a clientele or referral pattern where the patient has no insurance or pays cash at a certain reimbursed rate. And it can be still very profitable. That's the trend. Whether that's right or wrong, that's what's happening fiscally. I ask a question. Uh, and Joe, can you foresee indications for degenerative spine deformity done in surgical centers? Um, I do. I do think that that would be possible, um, especially if those patients could undergo uh, significant inner body work um, and posterior percutaneous fixation. Um, so even five, six level surgeries where, you know, you do a single position a lift followed by uh, laterals at multiple levels and then posterior percutaneous fixation fixation. So I think that's possible, but the, the, I think the, the problem is going to be like Kern was saying, trying to bring surgeons to that level. I, I don't, I don't think I know many uh, deformity surgeons out there who are able to do that in an efficient way because the whole surgery center is about what Dr. What Kern was saying about flipping over the rooms quickly, having a great turnover. And if you have somebody that's trying to put in, uh, uh, you know, 14 perk screws after their uh, four level inner body, that's somebody that's going to get kicked out of the surgery center really quickly. So, <laughs> so, so I think, I mean, it's possible, but I just, I don't, I'm not sure if the technology is there and I'm not sure if the skill set is there. Now, I think that's something that, for example, if you have a robot that could place screws while you're doing a single position lateral, I think that could be a, a tremendous uh, uh, asset if that could be developed and that, that you could, and some, something that's affordable. But then again, the, the surgery center is then spending money on that robot and that robot is not doing something else for the one level surgeon in the other room. So sort of the curse of deformity surgery is that, um, you know, no, oh, it's 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 not uh, very fiscally uh, or economically as wise as the uh, MIS platforms. <laughs> it's uh, you know so the challenge, Luis, is that it would never be in this system cost cost acceptable. Just the implant cost would cost more. Um, the most that I've ever done is three levels in a surgery center, and it becomes on the verge of a cost neutral event. Mm -hmm. But I'll be the first to admit, I think most. MIS only deformity surgery is criminal and looks horrendous on x-ray. It just looks, it's embarrassing what people put up. And maybe that's why I don't get invited to these lectures anymore. I don't get invited to these talks, but I'm the first to call out really bad MIS spine surgery. That, and I think people, you know, you probably have seen that. You guys have all seen this. When we first started this, these MIS deformity talks 10 years ago, how many flatbacks did we see? Yeah, great. Guys can put in five, six, seven cages and do whatever and put in some straight rods and screws. It looks horrendous. It's a disservice. You know, even now when I do an MIST lift and I've done over a thousand MIST lifts at this point, I do bilateral complete facetectomy through the tube. I hyperlordose. I use a pro axis table. I try to do everything I can. And I don't think 95% of people do that. And let alone when they tackle when you guys put up x-rays and you and it looks phenomenal, SVA correction, all these angles that I, st I still can't measure, I have to have my fellow measure. I see guys who put in cages left and right and it looks horrendous. It's a disservice to our patients. It's a complete disservice. I think you are right. The, the problem is that technology has to move 
in the direction of efficiency. So I don't think that uh, MIS surgery is only for two or three level of surgery. Uh, I think that we may have in the near future a surgeon doing three level laterals and his assistant doing uh, eight levels of posterior uh, percutaneous fusion at the same time. So uh, if this happens correctly, you know, I think we will speed and make a flow that may make sense for uh, even a, a surgery center. Uh, the, I mean, I, my rebuttal to that would be only that I saw one of Hanjo's slides and it still boggles my mind. Who is operating after 3 p.m.? I mean, I've never started a case yet. <laughs> that is what my claim to fame is, a semi-retired MIS spine surgeon. I'm never operating after 3 o'clock, ever. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> See? Cheers to that. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I, speaking from the person that just got out of the OR, that's why I was late to this as well. <laughs> okay, it was a wonderful evening. Uh, oh, you know, this uh, uh, generous sharing of your knowledge and, and thoughts. I really want to, to thank you guys. I uh, really appreciate uh, the effort and, you know, this friendly environment that we create here. Muito obrigado a todos. É, acho que já passamos quase que uma hora aí do nosso tempo estimado. É, gostaria de agradecer, em especial ao David, aceite, aceitar esse convite de última hora. Foi, foi realmente incrível a sua participação. Obrigado mais uma vez. Thank you, Kern. Thank you, Henjo. Thank you, Pimenta. Thank you. Thank you. Go Argentina. Go Argentina. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Boa noite a todos. Boa noite. Rodrigão.